time. We now return to further coverage of today's joint hearing, looking at the 1993 raid on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. The Oversight Committees uh, on Waco will come to order. The chair now recognizes Ms. Ross Layton from Florida. Five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to yield my time to Mr. Boyer. Thank you, gentlelady, for, uh, for yielding. One thing I want to make a uh, comment on is the uh, one of you, I think maybe it was you, Mr. Zimmer, testified that we've, we've had changes in policy but no really changes in the leadership. Yes, sir, that was and, me. Is that you? Yes, sir. One thing that, that I have noticed is I've, the last few days, of, as I sit and listen, whether it was Secretary Benson or Mr. Noble from yesterday, and uh, is that it's, it appears that the, the, the uh, political appointees uh, in the whole Waco so far, it's, it's almost been uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Uh, I either wasn't in charge at the time, but I sure am in charge now. Uh, and and uh, 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 either I didn't have the authority or it was outside my jurisdiction or, or that briefers didn't tell me enough information because if they had given me information, I probably would have made a different decision at the time. So, uh, but it's good to know they're in charge now. Um, well, let me... Uh, uh, did, did you want me to answer a question? No, I guess that was really political editorializing uh, on my part. And the change of leadership perhaps will come later. Um, let me ask a question with regard to uh, um, an arson, uh, an arson uh, expert. I'm going to go down here for a moment. Did either of you have an opportunity? Either of you have an opportunity to, uh, to meet with Mr. Paul Bray, uh, the so-called independent arson expert, to review the cause of the fire? Let me tell you how that happened. <coughs> I got a telephone call. Uh, within a couple of days of the fire from Paul Gray, who identified himself as an independent arson, arson investigator with uh, the Houston Fire Department. <coughs> he, Same Paul Gray, who's a business partner here, U.S. Department of Treasury, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Fire Paul C. Gray. Yes. yes. He told me that... He told me that he was a Houston Fire Department arson investigator. He'd been appointed to an independent panel to examine whether the, the fire and whether it was set deliberately or accidentally. I said, I'll cooperate in any way you want. I'll, I'll come back up to Waco. I'll tell you what I saw on the inside and how the place was a tinderbox and so forth, and uh, agreed to do so. And I called Jack Zimmerman to tell him that I'd been contacted. Maybe Jack ought to come up with me because he was there also to be interviewed. Jack said, wait a minute, this guy Paul Gray uh, was with the ATF. I think I've got his card. Um, his wife, is his wife employed also by ATF? I understand his wife is employed in the Houston office of the ATF. Um, I called the Texas Rangers and told them, wait a minute, I've been contacted by this Paul Gray. Should I talk to him? They said, wait, we don't know anything about him. I'm familiar with Texas. Rangers. Independence? <laughs> different in Texas? I know you like to. No. No, I think uh, it, it was clearly misleading. Mr. Boy, I have that card yes. there. If you want to see the original of that card. Mr. Gray had investigated the case that I had been involved in, in during the 80s, and the name struck a bell. And his card, which you really can't see on that blow up there, that shield says special agent. Uh, the, U the U.S. Department of the Treasury. And uh, when, that's when I informed Mr. DeGarren that not only uh, he had been, his office had been at the, that address up there and phone number is the ATF office. He, he officed there from 1982 to 1990. His wife was then at the time of the raid and is currently, when he did the arson investigation of this fire on the 19th, was still employed. And he had been in attendance at the funeral of one of the slain ATF agents. Did, did either of you let, let him know that you were on 
on to him that really wasn't? Yes, I did. I called him back and told him <clears throat> that I'd talk with uh, Ranger Captain Cook, and Captain Cook had advised me not to talk to him without a Ranger being present and that I wouldn't do so, and that I knew that he had been assigned to the ATF for many years, and I didn't feel like uh, he could be impartial and an independent investigator and that I wouldn't meet with him. Uh, he told me originally that his uh, report was due out the following Wednesday, uh, and as I understand it, he then sped that up and got the report out on Monday before we were able to reveal that uh, it was really not an independent arson review. Go ahead. At the, uh, Mr. Zimmerman, your testimony uh, described some misinformation coming out of the Department of Justice after the fire. Could you summarize? I heard you say that. Could you please tell me what you're referring to? There were a number of things that bothered me because I knew that they weren't true, and yet they, the uh, public statements continued to say them. For example, uh, it, it started uh, w with uh, uh, the, t the 10.30 in the morning briefing, and it was a combination at the beginning of both the uh, ATF and the, and the uh, FBI. The, uh, they said that the ATF did not alert the press before the February 28th attack. Well, you know now you've heard testimony that there was, in fact, uh, contact by a spokeswoman for the ATF. They said that the, they publicly announced that the ATF did not lose the element of surprise. I think that that's been well established in these hearings and, and by their own report. They said that two cultists confessed to starting the fire on April the 19th. And uh, of course that made everybody feel better because as the nation watched all the children and, and uh, women and uh, old men burn up there, if they knew that the cultists had started the fire themselves, they'd feel better about that. And I. Yeah, they, so they announced that they, uh, they confessed when there was never any confession to that. You're, you're bringing out a lot of interesting statements. I want you to, co to, co to conclude, but were either you guys interviewed by uh, Treasury or Justice on these, re these reports? No. I was not interviewed by either of those All right. uh, independent well, organizations. I don't mean to interrupt your answer. Would you please continue, Mr. Zimmer, and now we'll conclude uh, my time. They kept putting out the word that the April 19th operation was a non-aggressive action. And after the public saw that tank knocking into someone's door, uh, I think that even they began to call it an assault. Uh, they said that the Justice Department couldn't wait even another day because the children were being beaten during the siege. Of course, Dick DeGarren and I had been in there two weeks before, and we just could not believe that somebody would say that because we'd seen those children, we'd talked to them, we saw how they looked. And, of course, the FBI quickly corrected that uh, that came out of the justice, main justice, and the FBI said, look, we just gave them the 1992 reports. There had been investigations by Child Protective Services and found insufficient evidence to go forward. Um, they, they said it was a planned mass suicide. Uh, they kept putting that word out. It was a planned mass suicide. And, of course, uh, Dick and I had talked to those people about a planned mass suicide, and uh, every time we talked to them, they were sure there wasn't. I'm telling you what, I was supposed to be the last guy out on the, on the surrender plan, and if there had been even the slightest inkling in our minds that, that they were going to burn up the building or blow it up, I wouldn't have agreed to be the last guy out. And also, nine people did survive that fire, and they escaped that fire. If there was a mass suicide plan, why did those nine leave? They're still very devoted to David Koresh. And they, they escaped. You know why they escaped? Because they were near an opening. They were near a window, and they got out. The other people were trapped and couldn't get out. And when the bodies were found, uh, David Koresh and Steve Schneider and another person were found totally separated from everybody else. Not exactly a mass suicide scenario. They were putting out the word that the people mur they mur the Branch Davidians murdered people to keep them from escaping. Of course, there's no truth to that at all. There's no evidence to support that. And at the time that I wrote my written opening statement that you have in front of you, I wrote that in May 1993 when everything was really fresh and my memory was really fresh. I wrote that back then, and at that time, the autopsies had revealed maybe a dozen or so gunshot wounds. I think when they got through, it was up to 17 or 18. Well, there were 80-some-odd people in there, and Dick and I had talked to them. We knew that six of people had been killed by the ATF on February 28th. They better have bullets in them on autopsy. And then we knew some other people had been wounded inside, that is, Branch Davidian, so they ought to have had bullets in them. So. There may have been a couple of people that, that rather than go through the fiery death and the
painful burning to death may have, if there was a weapon there, decided to put their, their relative or their friend or themselves out of misery, but it certainly wasn't a murder situation. Of course, they... Are you going to finish with that? I have about one more, sir. Okay, are you answering the question? I'm answering asked? the question about the misinformation program that we were... Okay, as long as you're answering the question, you, you can pr uh, proceed. The next one was is that, of course, that David Koresh was not working on his Seven Seals project, that it was a sham, that they had lied. They actually held a briefing on the day of the fire. And if you look at the tape, it says, we know they were lying to their lawyers. Well, we know now Dick has gone into that. You'll talk to the next witnesses, and they'll give you a copy of that Seven Seals, uh, the first seal transcribed. And lastly, uh, you know, they said that they, the government was go had gone in on February the 28th and April the 19th uh, uh, because of the child abuses occurring. And I think that we can probably let that go by saying that will probably never be proven beyond uh, to, to anybody's satisfaction that that was occurring on April, before February 28th and before April the 19th. And neither one, even if it were, justifies federal law enforcement launching military attacks because they have no jurisdiction over that matter anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers. Thank Five you, minutes. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, are you representing any of the Branch Davidians in lawsuits against no, the government? No, sir. Mr. DeGerwin? No, sir, I'm not. Right. Uh, one of you made the statement that uh, if we'd had 10 more days, you, you felt that uh, I did, Mr. Sir. Koresh would come out. Uh, what do you base that on? We were called, um, we called, the, we were allowed to call by the FBI on April the 14th, and they told us that that waiting period in, in, in the book of Revelation had been answered and that David Koresh was to decode the seven seals in writing. That would be ending the waiting period. And they, we told him, send it out to us. He put it in writing. He signed it. We gave it to the FBI. He told us it was taking one to two days for seal. He had finished the first seal and was working on the second one. So that'd be about 10 days, sir. Well, we, there had been so many disappointments uh, with Mr. Koresh's uh, agreements to cooperate that we had had a, a little bit of a problem there as, as far as uh, I'm concerned and as far as ATF was concerned. Now, Mr. Zimmerman, is it true that in 1987, David Koresh and his mighty men, including Stephen Schneider, who's been described by one of you as a peaceful man, engaged in a gun battle to settle a dispute with George Roden over who would be the leader of the Branch Davidians? I, I don't believe that's an accurate rendition, sir. And, and can I there, back there up? There was not a gun battle. Though the way you described uh, uh, it. Well, wait a minute engaged in a gun battle to settle a dispute with George Roden. Uh, you don't want to know did what... That, did that happen? No, I don't need explanations, yes or no. No, I'm not aware Steve Schneider was even... Uh, he was in Hawaii at that okay. time, sir. What about uh, David Koresh? Was he in Hawaii? No, sir. I see. Okay. Uh, isn't it also true after that incident that Mr. Koresh did not peacefully surrender to the sheriff, but was in fact arrested at gunpoint. No, no that's, that's wrong too, sir. Oh, I see. Okay. <clears throat> now, we, we have some uh, statements that indicated that there was a uh, about the fires that, that were begun. And I, I have pre uh, presented to you at the table the uh, electronic surveillance tapes or some of the transcripts from them. Uh, the, uh, the, the import is that it... Uh, strongly supports the fact that some of the Davidians were themselves uh, starting the fire. Uh, these are electronic surveillance tapes transcribed from April 19th, and, and it sort of establishes the, 
the Davidians started the fire. These are excerpts and shows that they were pouring fuel inside the compound during the tear gas operation. Uh, the full transcripts reveal that the Davidians discussed getting fuel ready and pouring it, needing more fuel, uh, discussing whether it was poured in the hallway, spreading the fuel, where the fuel should be spread, discussing whether to light the fire and keep it going. I, I bring to your attention selected comments from unidentified males. You want it poured? Another un uh, unidentified male. Pablo, have you poured it yet? Uh, another voice. Things are poured, right? Uh, another comment. Need to get the fuel out. Uh, an another comment. I need a gas mask. Unidentified female, unidentified male. I need a gas mask. Another unidentified male. Got any fuel? Unidentified male. We need fuel. Unidentified male. Fuel over here. Unidentified male, 6, 10 a.m. Don't pour it all out. We might need some later. 6, 12 a.m. Unidentified male. You've got to get the fuel ready. Another unidentified male. I already poured it. It's already poured. On the page afterward, unidentified male from the transcript. They got some fuel around in here? Unidentified male. Yeah, they even poured it already. Unidentified male. Poured it already. Unidentified male, he's got it poured already. 619, side B of the, or, or side B, there's no time indicated. Uh, shall we light the package now? Yep, okay, light it. Now these are, these, these are transcriptions that are, are don't, don't indicate that uh, Anybody but the Davidians poured the oil, the gas that set fire to this compound. You nod your head, Mr. Daguerre. Yes, yes, sir. I'm familiar with that, and it concerned me uh, when I was being told by the FBI that they thought that they had evidence that the Davidians started the fire. And I, so I questioned the survivors that I'd uh, talked to in the jail, the one that, ones that got out. They explained to me that they were pouring fuel and that they were making Molotov cocktails to throw at the tanks. Mm -hmm. If you'll notice that that pouring of the fuel takes place, uh, or the conversation about that takes place about <clears throat> in the early morning hours, 6 and 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the fire didn't start until right around noon. It's questionable about whether it started just before or just after noon, but those those uh, conversations about pouring the fuel, I believe, had to do with preparing Molotov cocktails to throw at the tanks. Now, they never did throw Molotov cocktails at the tanks. Secondly, as uh, all of the survivors were unanimous in saying that they did not start the fire and knew of no plan to burn the place down. No. Well, let's keep the Mr. fire Congress. going. That doesn't sound I, like pouring Molotov cocktails. In the and time I that's, in the I time think that gentleman's state, time has expired. I think you're Thank a you. defense Mr. Term. Micah from Florida for five minutes. I can, I can, answer, I can answer that. We, we can get back to it. Okay. Uh, this thing can go on all afternoon if we let it. Thank you, Mr. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just have to take 30 seconds here and say that, uh, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen on the panel and the, the people that are, are watching this proceeding, that I, I'm absolutely personally outraged at some of the comments I've heard from the White House and the administration. I'm so glad Mr. Coble spoke to this earlier, that Republican participation in these hear hearings are some effort to discredit law enforcement or attack law enforcement or that I personally have some hidden agenda in this. And, and I'm just absolutely sick and tired of it, and, and I, I really resent 
these people making those comments about me personally. The other thing uh, is we have a responsibility, and Mr. Zimmerman, you talked about it, a responsibility to, to find out what happened here, how 80 people, and we don't count Koresh, died in this and four ATF agents and many other wounded. Gentlemen, can you cite me any other instance in the history of this country where in a federal action there were this many people killed uh, by a federal action? I don't think there is one, and I don't think there's another one that ever had could, American tanks used you, against American citizens. Respond, sir, have you ever heard of I, anything? I've never like heard of that, and I've never heard of tanks being used against American citizens in their own country. And we, we've tried to look at each thing, and we've had two of the fairest chairmen in the House of Representatives. These individuals have bent over backwards to try to bring this evidence out. And if anything, the administration and other people have tried to obstruct these proceedings, even from the very beginning. And you've cited that, Mr. Zimmerman, have you not? You were never, you were never called to participate in any of these. Is that correct for the That's record? Correct. That's correct. These reports? You know, I wanted to get into personnel questions. I had about 12 minutes yesterday to discuss the personnel. Turn the, the chart over and show the the personnel uh, responsibility here. And Mr. Zimmerman, you <coughs> pointed it out, and we heard it for several days. Rodzik, Rodriguez blamed Sereban with <coughs> and Winoski, and Winoski uh, talked about Hart, Hartnett, and Hartnett blamed Noble. And then we got up to uh, Noble, and uh, he said he wasn't in charge, that maybe it was Simpson. And then uh, we asked, we heard from Altman, and Altman said that. Uh, well, it wasn't his watch, it was Benson, and Benson blamed Reno. What do the American people think when they see this? Is, is this the chain of responsibility? Nobody was, uh, ended up being fired, is that correct? That's my understanding. Couple they, people they were fired and rehired. Yes, fired and rehired. But that's some of the questions here that need to be raised. What kind of a message do you think this sends to the American people? When I've given speeches on this subject around the thing that bothers the uh, mainstream Kiwanis Club, uh, accountants groups, breakfast groups I've spoken to, the thing that bothers them the most is they're worried that this will happen again because the same people are still there. You were on your way and you told us to resolving this issue and you said you were well on your way to resolving this issue and you were riding in North Texas. I read your statement last night. Uh, and they had delayed these proceedings for what? Passover, was it? They were celebrating Passover and that's why yes, when our federal officials made the decision to, to do this, is that correct? I don't know exactly when the decision was made. I know there was a process going on. I know that from reading the Justice Department report. Did you report. see or hear of any reports of children being molested while you were in the compound? I saw all of the children. I saw the parents. I saw the rooms where they were living. I saw their living environment. And I didn't see any children that well, I thought were being abused. One of the things that concerns me is, again, the government's use, and we have a whole a bunch of scenarios of mistakes. Everything in here. In all these reports, everyone says the government screwed up. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, well, not in, not in the Justice Department. Uh, okay. That's a whitewash. All right. Well, but they pointed fingers, but nobody took responsibility. In the report, the Department of Justice report, I read this, this report, and it describes the condition of the children. There were, over, there were 25. You can't tell exactly how many children were because they were incinerated beyond recognition, but we'll give or take a few. They're somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 people incinerated. Audrey Martinez was buried alive inside the bunk bunker. She died of suffocation. She was identified from dental records, 13 years old. Uh, these mostly doe because they couldn't doe 67. Seven to eight year old boy buried alive, suffocated in bunker. Doe, a six year old girl suffocated inside bunker. They used CS gas. What do you think about the decision to use this and these children that were incinerated or suffocated by an action of the federal government? Can I tell you my experience with CS gas? Tell to me put the answer your experience, question? sir. All Marine lieutenants go through the, the ga CS gas chamber to teach you how to use your gas mask and to gain confidence that that gas mask will work. So I've been through that. And the process is you go into an enclosed area, they pop a CS gas grenade, you have your mask on, you take it off, and you count to 10 or state your name enough so that you can inhale a small amount. Then you put your mask back on, put your hands over the filters, clear your mask by blowing outward, blows the gas out, and then you are able to breathe and but you now have confidence. Their report, didn't their report say that gas masks don't fit on these babies? That's correct. And didn't they know that? 
They should have known that. Let me continue if I Go can. Ahead. When you come out of that gas chamber and only haven't been exposed for a matter of seconds, your eyes burn, your nose burns, and your, 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 all, all mucous membranes are affected. Grown, healthy, cream of the crop of the United States youth, Marine lieutenants, are hurting when they come out of that gas chamber. In 1980, I was taking a battalion to Norway on a reserve active duty joint NATO operation. We had to go through that chamber because the Norwegians were going to use gas as part of our training. I was going to be, you know, lead from the front. I was going to be the first one through a temporary gas chamber we set up at Ellington Air Force Base in Houston, Texas. To make a long story short, I take my mask off, they pop two grenades, doubling the concentration that it should have been, and I was choking to death. I couldn't see, I was disoriented, I didn't know where I was, and I was a, a major of the Marine Corps. I barely got out, got out to, the, to the fresh air, and I'm sitting there, my eyes are burning, I'm, I'm vomiting, uh, I'm kneeling over, I'm in extreme pain, and all my troops are lined up there, and I know they were resisting the urge to laugh at the old man doing that, and also simultaneously thinking, I ain't going in there. Well, we got it fixed. The point I'm getting at is, it's terribly debilitating. CS gas is terrible. And I know it's still that way because both my grown children, at the time Waco was going on, were lieutenants at Quantico. They had gone through the gas chamber. My daughter just went through again on her annual training last week. Now, you're going to have people that testify on gas. Please, if anybody comes in here and tells you that CS gas is not torturing children, ask them to do one thing. Tell them, ask them this. Ma'am or sir, will you get in a car with me and drive 35 miles down to Quantico, on the Marine base at Quantico, we'll put a video camera in the car with you. Take you down to that Marine gas chamber, put on your gas mask, let us pop a couple gas grenades in that chamber, then you take your mask off and let's videotape you for just five minutes in that chamber without a gas mask. See if any of them will take that challenge. They won't, because you'll choke to death in that period of time with the wrong concentration. I believe that using CS gas against infants, against old people with respiratory problems, there were 60, 70 year old men in there, and there were young children. That's torture. And I can just see those kids barfing, vomiting, screaming, because you can't possibly have a gas mask that'll fit a little kid. They, at best, I think one of the reports said that, or survivors said that they had taken, to try to help them, they had taken a, a washcloth and put water on it to try to put it over their face so it won't time burn as fast. Time has expired. And in, in fairness, uh, just in case I might have shut you off from trying to finish up, Mr. Conyers, uh, if you could just take 30 seconds and try to wrap up. The, the <clears throat> I think that the point I was trying to get to, Mr. Conyers, is that when the discussion is of keep the fire going, uh, must have had to do with either the Coleman lanterns, which they were using for lighting, or for the butane they were using for heating, but not the starting of fire, because it doesn't coincide with the start of the fire. Are you there? No, sir. Thank you. OK, Mr. the chair now recognizes Mr. Schumer from New York for five minutes. And then uh, immediately after his five minutes, we will break for a vote and come back here. I think it's one vote. Is that correct? Five-minute vote. Is there a five-minute vote after? <laughs> okay, we'll come back five minutes after the vote. Mr. Schumer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I want to say to both Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. DeGuerin, I admire your abilities as defense lawyers. You are doing an excellent job doing what defense lawyers do, which is to defend the people they represent uh, to the best of their abilities. But I have real problems with some of these, with many of the statements. Just one, Mr. Zimmerman. We'll have experts later talking about gas and there is no record of CS gas, which is simply the mildest form of tear gas. Mr. Guerin said not tear gas, but CS gas. But we're going to talk about gas later. What I want to talk about is not your impressions of other things from talking to other people, who shot first, what the gas is. That's really not what's material here. What's material here is your involvement in the negotiations. That's something you were firsthand involved in. Your testimony on that is uh, what would be admitted in a court of law, whereas the other stuff would not. And my point, I know you stated, Mr. Zimmerman, that he was just about ready to come out and some, I think you used the term Washington, faceless Washington bureaucrat blew the deal. Only because I don't know who made that terrible decision. Yeah, you don't know if he's in Washington or Houston or on the field either, do you? 
What makes Can you I say explain Washington? that? Then, because I had the greatest just admiration. Please, yes or no. What if, well, you asked me what makes me okay, feel that. I'm just trying to use my time here. Then you're going to give me extra did, time? Did you Chairman? ask him a question? Yeah, and I want him to answer it my way. Why don't you please. answer it? We'll I don't want to answer it the truth. I'm not going to answer it your way or any other way except the truth. Okay, then now, you tell want me the truth? how you knew it was from Washington. I, I, because, I, let me tell you why. Because please. those special agents in charge in Waco are honorable men. Jeff Jamar went way out on a limb to let the two of us go in there. Bob Ricks was straight with us all the time. Just Byron just my time, sir. Yeah. Jeff Jamar says he made the decision himself that no one in Washington made it. Do you doubt his word? He will tell us that when I he think, comes. I think that... Do you uh, doubt his word, yes or no? I would doubt that. You would, okay. Even though he was an honorable, courteous individual. Let me just say, you two gentlemen also, it is true, came in on the negotiations 30... You two gentlemen came in on the bells, bells, bells. Yes, sir. You two gentlemen came in on the negotiations approximately a month after they had begun. That's correct. Isn't that correct? You too, Mr. DeGaran? Yes, sir. And in that 30 days, Koresh had lied repeatedly to the agents. On April 2nd, he states that it's a fact he's coming out if a tape is played. The tape is played on local Waco TV on CBN, and he doesn't come out. On March 7th, he says he won't be that long. Then on April 2nd, he says he's going to come out right after Passover. Doesn't come out. Finally, on April 15th, Mr. Schneider says they're going to come out after the seven seals, but admits that Koresh lied about coming out on March 2nd. Those are his words on the tape, that Mr. Koresh, his associate, his chief lieutenant, or you don't like the term chief lieutenant, uh, Mr. Schneider, who is his, one of his devoted followers and acolytes, says that Mr. Koresh lied. So what we have here is lie after lie after lie by Mr. Koresh, a man who we know has violated federal laws, who has abused children, and all of a sudden on April 15th, we know, you somehow know that he is telling the truth. Well, I have real problems with that. I think most people would have real problems with that because his pattern was not to tell the truth. And in fact, further, he said, well, he will come out, not within five minutes, but after he finished doing his writing on the seventh seals. And when asked, uh, Mrs. Schneider, forgot her first name, Judy. with a J. Judy. Judy Schneider. When Judy Schneider was asked on the tape how long it would take to transcribe his... Um, interpretation of the seven seals, she said about a year. Then she later said to, to a little bit later, she said, well, if I was given a laptop computer, it would be somewhat shorter than that. Never said how much shorter. So it is certainly clear, Mr. Zimmerman, that even if the FBI had said yes, that it would take some time for him to do his work on the seven seals. Is that on the seven seals? Isn't that correct? He wasn't going to come out in five minutes or that day or the next day. No, he was going to come out at, at, we told him in two days per seal that one was finished, so it would be about 12 days. And Mr. Jamar said, that's fine. That's good. 12 days. Yes, okay. sir. He agreed now, to that. Wait. Okay. Well, we'll ask Mr. Jamar that because I think Jamar's interpretations, who you call an honorable person, we won't see him. Is he on the B panel or C panel? You know, we're not going to see him till later this evening, but Mr. Jamar's interpretations are quite at variance with yours as to what happened. And I would simply say to you that someone like Mr. Koresh, who lies and lies and lies, and has three times promised to come out and not come out, and if you have to make the decision whether to say, okay, well, let's give him another 12 or 15 days so he can write his seven seals, and let us say that in hindsight, we know what has happened, but just let us say that they gave him those 12 or 15 days and the compound was burnt internally by Mr. Koresh and many, many children were killed. We would be, and you would be, as a good defense lawyer, excoriating, excoriating the FBI and everybody else for waiting so long. You would make the argument, you'd make it much better than I ever could, Mr. Zimmerman. You'd say he lied on, April, on March 2nd. He lied on March 7th. He lied on April 2nd. He lied on April 15th. And all of a sudden, 
they wanted to believe him on April 15th and give him two more weeks. Gentlemen, that doesn't make any sense. I'd just like Mr. Zimmerman to respond because I feel that he's entitled to, if that's okay that's with you, fair. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Congressman. First of all, when the lawyers got involved uh, approximately on the, at the very end of March, in my judgment, there was never a promise of a specific date, and there never was a broken promise by Mr. Koresh. That needs to be clarified. Once Dick DeGuerin became his lawyer, Mr. Koresh never gave a false promise that do anything that he didn't do. Second, no, wait a minute. Well, you asked me to tell your observation, sir. The dates you gave are wrong, okay? All the dates, like, he never said on April the 2nd that he was coming out at any particular time because Mr. DeGuerin and I were involved by April the 2nd, so I know that's wrong. Now, the, the, there were some other promises before that, but you have to put it in context. Until there was somebody he trusted, he didn't trust those people out there. But once Mr. DeGuerin became involved, that's when it happened. Now, the, in response to your other situation, that's a hypothetical that, that uh, I would have to have a, uh, a uh, crystal ball that's more clear than mine is. Time has expired. We now will take a recess until five minutes after this vote coming up. We'll return for more of Day 5 of the Waco Investigation hearings, but first some programming notes. Sunday on Book Notes, ABC's John Hockenberry. As a correspondent for NPR, he traveled to the Middle East to cover the Persian Gulf War. In the mid-80s, he volunteered to be the first journalist in space. This weekend, he talks about the challenges he faces closer to home. A lot of times in New York, you have to wait for taxis. I mean, in the rain, for instance, you have to wait for five taxis before someone will pick you up if you're in a wheelchair and you're by yourself. If you're in a wheelchair with somebody, they'll stop. If you're in a wheelchair by yourself, you know, you have to kind of take your chances. If it's nice out, you'll do a little better. If there's a 40 mile an hour wind and it's Christmas Eve, believe me, you don't do very well at all. And one cab passed me by, a second cab passed me by, and I remember thinking, oh, come on, Santa, you know, it's time. It's time for a break here. Let's just get me downtown again. I'm freezing. And the third one passed me by. And then somebody comes and sees me, a cabbie comes and sees me, and, and starts to pull over, but then changes lanes. He goes over into the left lane, but he's caught by the light. So he's stuck there in the intersection with his turn signal on, turning left, pretending like he hasn't seen me. Well, I said, this is ridiculous. So I roll over, open the door, and say, can you take a fare? He says, yes. I get out. I get in the back seat. I fold up my chair. And I say, please put the chair in the back, in the trunk. And I did. I absolutely said, please, this first time. And uh, he goes, no, it's too cold. Emmy award-winning journalist John Hockenberry and his book, Moving Violations, War Zones, Wheelchairs, and Declarations of Independence, Sunday night on Book Notes at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. We now return to further coverage of today's joint hearing looking at the 1993 raid on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. The uh, joint uh, oversight hearings on Waco will now come to order. Chair uh, recognizes Mr. Schiff from New Mexico for five minutes. Can I wait a moment to the minute witnesses are, are back, uh, Mr. Chairman? Okay. okay. I think we have the button. Get them settled in. 
Okay, uh, gentlemen, I, I've been very, very critical of the presentation earlier in this hearing of the victimization of Kiri Jewell because as serious as child rape is, of course, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms was conducting a firearms law investigation and search, and uh, the issue of Mr. Koresh's depravity is not what they were investigating or going to serve a search warrant for. And I think that that testimony was put into this hearing to take newspaper headlines and other media attention away from a lot of the testimony about the law enforcement participation in the raid. But I don't mean to imply by that that Mr. Koresh had no involvement in this whole situation. Obviously, he did. And in, in all of this discussion of the negotiations, I have this question. After, after the, the raid failed, let, let's pick it up from there, and the siege began, and the negotiations are going, we know that we have four dead Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms agents, and we, we believe we had six dead members of the Branch Davidian sect. Wasn't it time for the people inside to come out and at that point make their case in court? In other words, how would they have any justification for not coming out and, and, and allowing this matter to go to the courts when a number of people have died uh, in, in the raid situation? Uh, I'll go to whoever wants, wants to respond first. Uh, Mr. DeGarrett. Legal, legal justification for waiting? No, there was no justification for it. My plan, what I wanted to do, was to walk out with David Koresh and have all the rest of the people come out. My whole reason for going in there was to go get my client and take him to court where I knew how to work. And what we tried to do, Jack and I together, was to get those on the inside, not just David Koresh, but all of them, to reconcile their beliefs with the law. They believe that the, their beliefs, their, their religion, was paramount and superior to the law. And as you know, it's not. Uh, Let me interrupt because my time is, is uh, uh, limited here. Very quickly, did the FBI impede anyone from leaving who wanted to leave? No. No. Okay. All right. Quickly, gentlemen, because we're going to get into this in other testimony. Mr. Zimmerman, you talked about CS gas. Yes. The, uh, you do know the FBI will say that of all the written reports on the use of CS gas, there is no established lasting effects to anyone from the use of CS gas. That's what they're going to, to say. That's why I asked you, sir, get somebody that says that. Say, look, will you drive down to Quantico with me? Let me video you in a gas chamber for five minutes without a gas mask. And if he says he will, take him up. Right. Do it. And, fi and finally, for my question, Mr. DeGarren, you were asked about the fire and what started the fire. Do you have enough information at this point to have, have an estimation of what did cause the fire? I think it was probably started accidentally by the lanterns being uh, crushed or turned over. They were, they were using lanterns, Coleman lanterns with liquid fuel for lighting, or it started from a spark, or it started in some uh, accidental fashion. That's what I believe because, not because I want to believe that or because I have anybody to represent. I don't have anybody to represent here. I'm telling you what I saw on the inside and what the people told me. And the survivors told me that they did not start that fire. Thank, on thank you again. Let me interrupt because time is short. Thank you, gentlemen. Chairman, I'd like to yield any time I have remaining to Mr. Shabbat. Thank you. Uh, as I've said consistently during these hearings, I think the real purpose of these hearings, what should be the purpose, is to find out all the facts, let the chips fall where they may, and try to avoid future loss of life, whether it be law enforcement officials or whether it be civilians. And, and you two gentlemen have studied this case in depth and, and were inside uh, the compound when others were not. And really, I think you have some insight that, that everybody else really lacks. Um, I would like to ask both you gentlemen, you can both answer, what are the lessons to be learned from Waco? What should the United States government learn so that we can avoid a tragedy like this from ever happening again? Provocative force, excessive force, breeds excessive violence. The use of excessive force by law officers serving a warrant is doomed to tragedy. Now, what we saw on February the 28th 
was the use of far more force than was justified or necessary under the circumstances. What this committee needs to do is go back and examine the decision to use the excessive force then. That carries right through to April the 19th because this atmosphere of macho, we've got to do something, we've got to bring this to an end, resulted in tanks and tear gas being used against some if you want to put it this way, religious nuts that were holed up in a compound. There had been no one injured, no one threatened, no one hurt for 51 days, and the FBI is to be congratulated for bringing that about. But the force that was used on April the 19th again was excessive. And so the real lessons to be learned and how to prevent it, I don't know, is stopping the use of excessive force. That's my read. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Sir, I hope that in addition to what Dick Guerin has just said, that what we can learn from this is that we need to reestablish faith in uh, federal law enforcement. At one time, as a defense lawyer, I can tell you, the FBI was viewed as the elite of federal law enforcement. It was the Texas Rangers of the federal law enforcement community, if you will. That is not the case today, and we've got to reestablish that. And the only way I think we can do it and I'm not sure whether this oversight committee can or not, but I hope you can at least go down the road a bit. We have to establish leadership accountability. That's what the American public is concerned about. There's been no leadership accountability. In my frame of reference, the commander, in a military sense, has responsibility and authority. He can delegate the authority, but he never delegates the responsibility. Something goes wrong on his watch, he's responsible. Let me give you an example that pales in comparison. There's no loss of life. But a terrible thing happened at Tailhook, all right? That was not a, any loss of life. There was some illegality, and that responsibility went all the way to the Secretary of the Navy, and he resigned over that. There's been no personal leadership accountability in the Department of Justice at all. And in the Treasury Department, the people who were found by their own investigators to have lied and committed crimes are still working for you and me. Thank you. I see that I'm out of time, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Pardon? And I know I'm out of order, but I would like to know what crime those Treasury people have been convicted of, sir. Convicted of? Yes, sir. No, Mr. Merletti testified yesterday in answer to a question from somebody on the committee or subcommittee, and I don't know who, whether or not federal law was violated. And he said, yes, there were federal felonies when those agents uh, uh, provided false statements as to their activities at Waco. I think, no, I, I think, no, you don't leave for a criminal until you've been convicted. I think time has expired. I'd like to recognize Mr. Lantos from California for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> we have had a few minutes ago an absolutely mind-boggling exchange between a member of this committee on the other side and the two of you, which I would like to return to because it reveals either a degree of unbelievable ignorance of recent American history or sophistry of the worst type. Let me tell you what I have in mind. We had, not too many years ago, a criminally insane charismatic leader by the name of Jim Jones who caused the death of about 900 American citizens, children and women, with no FBI, ATF, Justice Department, tanks, or gas being involved. Now, you were asked, the two of you, by Mr. Micah, 10 minutes ago, whether there is any incident in American history where American citizens were so killed. And you both claimed not to know of any such episode. He didn't seem to know of any such episode. But well, let me give a new approach to the two theories that have been used so far. We have heard throughout these hearings that we are either dealing with a degree of bureaucratic incompetence and stupidity of incredible proportions, or worse yet, a conspiracy on the part of the federal government to kill American citizens. I reject both of these notions uh, because I think what we have here is a pattern 
on the part of an insanely criminal, charismatic leader in charge of a sect who has apocalyptic visions, who teaches children to commit suicide, who puts guns into the mouth of children, who is responsible for this nightmare which has unfolded on our television sets. But for the two of you to sit there and claim either ignorance of or forgetfulness concerning the Jonestown tragedy where planned mass suicide of American citizens unfolded involving many times the number of tragedies that we had in this unfortunate incident. And to have a member of this committee claim no knowledge of this stretches, stretches credibility. Would you like an answer? No, not yet, when I'm finished. Uh, what I am suggesting to you, and I am resisting the temptation to comment on the cheap political shots about political appointees of an administration which had been in office just a few weeks when all these things unfolded. Uh, what I am telling you is that the most plausible single explanation for this nightmare, namely the apocalyptic vision of a criminally insane charismatic cult leader who was hell-bent on bringing about this infernal nightmare in flames and the extermination of the children and the women and the other innocent is not an explanation that should be cast aside. No one knows what Koresh had in mind. You don't and I don't. But if we have any intelligence, we go back to the only other example in American history, not that far back in history, the Jonestown nightmare of 900 Americans killing themselves, finishing their lives, in many cases promising lives, because of the evil and criminal approach of a charismatic cult leader. Now you are saying, uh, Mr. Guerin, I saw in David Koresh not a person who was insane, a person who was deeply committed and sincere about his religious beliefs. Well, I am sorry for you if that's what you see in him. I see in him a criminally insane, charismatic cult leader who caused the death of all these innocents. And I would like both of you to comment on my observation. Let me let, me let Mr. DeGuerin have the last word. Let me comment with regard to your two theories, gross incompetence or a conspiracy. And let me agree with you, Congressman Lantos, that I have seen no credible evidence of a conspiracy on the part of either the ATF or the FBI or the Treasury Department or the Justice Department. I have seen no credible evidence of a conspiracy to harm Americans. So I'm I, glad to hear I that. agree with you. I have never said that. Dick DeGaron has never said that. We've had Many nothing. have implied it. Not, not us. I'm not, not, not these two people here. I'm not you for the conspiracy theory. In fact, you know that we, we requested to be on a panel separate so that there would, our credibility would not be placed against some people who have conspiracy theories. I disagree, though. I think that it is an example of gross incompetence, and we've already been through that. We may just agree to disagree. Now, with regard to the question about the Jonestown matter, maybe because I was up all night, you weren't here, when I, the chairman began by announcing that I had a granddaughter born this morning at 4.15 in the morning. I didn't get much sleep. It was our first grandchild. So maybe I, I wasn't so sharp. So I congratulate you. <laughs> right. Maybe I wasn't as sharp as I should be. But I thought the question said, are you aware of any American law enforcement action in the United States that had this great a loss of life? And if that was the question, which I think it was, I stand by my answer. Jonestown was not an American law enforcement action, and it wasn't a law enforcement action at all, and it wasn't in America. Will you, will you allow the other witness to answer, Mr. Chairman?
If it hadn't been uh, David Koresh, it would have been somebody else. Uh, I think the, the reason I'm here is to try to offer some insight into how to prevent this from happening, not to defend David Koresh or his actions. And as I see it, this ended in tragedy because there was a failure to understand that not only David Koresh but his followers had this apocalyptic vision and the actions of the FBI in increasing the pressure and violence played right into that ap apocalyptic vision. That's what I'm saying about his beliefs, his belief systems, whether you believe he was crazy or a child molester or anything else. His belief systems were in place and very sincere. He might have been crazy. This outcome. But th the point is, the failure to understand that and then to work within that belief system, to try to use that belief system as I was doing, as, as Arnold and Tabor and Jack were doing, to try to say, well, the Bible does say you should come out. The Bible does say that the apocalypse is not now, it's later, and therefore come on out, go in jail. Like There's been a lot of good writing in jail, I said to David, and not just in jest. I said there's some of the greatest writing in the, in the world has been done by someone who was in jail and had all the time to write. And so what I'm saying, Mr. Lantos, and members of the committee, is that we've got to understand, law enforcement has got to understand what they're working with and not just demonize and, ri and ridicule in order to justify their actions. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yes. I have a unanimous consent request. I'd just like to add into the record the tapes, the transcripts of the tapes, each time that David Koresh promised he'd come out and didn't, including the date of April 2nd, which Mr. Zimmerman said didn't exist. Without objection. State your objection. Well, what, what will this be? Will this be identified as Mr. Schumer's impression of the promises that were made because we have conflicting uh, ceremony sir, on it? Sir, if, let, me, let, me, let me state my reservation, please, Mr. Schumer, and then you, you certainly are not, sh not shy about responding. Uh, if, if it's going into the record, Mr., uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, as fact, then I would object to it. If this is simply a document that Mr. Schumer wants to put in that is identified as his interpretation of promises were made, then I have no objection. Okay, I don't, I don't need that, Tom. I just want to respond, which is very simply, these are the transcripts, transcribed of the tapes. They tape the negotiations where Koresh promised to come out. It has none of my personal imprint in any way on it other than perhaps the fingerprints uh, when I handed over the document. And I doubt that those would appear in the copies that were made anyway. If, if it's just documents that are not identified uh, as, as reaching a conclusion, then I would have no objection. Without objection, so ordered. Chief Heineman from North Carolina has five minutes. Mr. DeGaron, I'd like to go over again that April of 14th, that um, you said there was a document it's uh, attached to my statement. It's the last document in my statement. It's a, a letter, a handwritten letter signed by Koresh. Can uh, you summarize that, please? Well, what it says is that um, he's been given the task, and I suppose this was the word from God that he said he was waiting on. And look, I'm, I'm not trying to make a pass a judgment on that. Some people truly believe they get the word of God. Some people truly believe they speak to God. Billy Graham's one of them. So it's not so words unusual. Less. But he said that he'd received now the message that what he had to do was to write his interpretation of the seven seals. It's not a long book and a long manuscript, but to dictate it. And then he would come out and go into the criminal justice system. and. The, the, the reason that that was such a revelation, such a change in what had happened before, was he was giving the religious arguments for doing that. Why was he doing this? He, well, he gave that to you? You say you passed that on to the FBI? Yes. And for what purpose? You mean what was his purpose in yes. doing that? I yes. think it was because he believed it. 
And he said, and all the rest of the people in uh, Mount Carmel at the time said they were overjoyed that now this message had been received. Now, it was fine with me. I, I didn't really appreciate the, the religious significance of it, but Tabor and Arnold, please ask them about that. They did and can tell you how significant it was within the belief system. He had written two letters the, a couple of days before that leading up to it. He, that is Koresh, used the religious arguments in this letter for why he had now seen that the scriptures told him to come out. They, they based their life on what the scripture said. It's at some point in this transaction between him giving you the letter and you passing it on, did the Texas Rangers fit into this at all? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Um, I know you, you mentioned it before, but I'd like to be a little more clear on that. I, I wanted uh, the Texas Rangers to be doing the investigation. I wish I could say I was responsible for that. Uh, and at one point, uh, there was some dispute over whether the ATF would be involved in the investigation once the surrender occurred. Uh, I talked to several people about that, and I made it known that I, I thought that would be a stumbling block, and I wanted the Rangers to be there. What eventually was agreed to was that the Rangers would conduct the investigation. There would be a Ranger present at the surrender, and when was that surrender supposed to take place? We didn't have an exact date. Was it supposed to happen that day? No. You did mention at some point that you and Koresh were going to come out and, and Mr. Zimmerman was going to bring up the tail end of that. That's correct. Was that, did that have anything to do with that letter coming forth and the people's jubilation? Well, if I understand the question, it, no, there was not a direct relationship with that, but the, the letter was the turning point in now Koresh said, I'm coming out, here's when I'm coming out, it's not an exact date, but it's as soon as I complete this manuscript. He was working on the manuscript, we know that because we got it uh, after the fire, and, and, and it was a, a, a real turning point in what he said. I, I thought it so important that I, I immediately gave a copy of it, this is attorney-client privilege stuff, immediately gave a copy of it to the FBI and told them what I thought about it and even talked to Tabor and Arnold in the in the following days and called Jamar and told him how significant I thought it was and that Tabor and Arnold were saying it was significant so I thought once we received this letter I could quit worrying about when he's going to come out and start worrying about the trial and getting prepared for trial okay now let me just make reference to to um, that photo you see on the wall there relative to the ATF arriving at the scene and you made mention of that and they appear to me and and I think there's no question that they're in a defensive position at this point they are they appear to be in a in a position where there's fire exchanging with being exchanged yes right now that would you, there's nobody near the door so apparently something happened from the time they left the tent, the, the canvas over the, the trucks, to the point where they took up a defensive position. Okay. Has that gone um, without an opinion during the trial? No. Well, I can give you the two conflicting ones. The government's position was is when the two agents came up to serve the warrant and Mr. Koresh closed the door, gunfire erupted from the inside through that right-hand side of the door to the extent that it bolted out backwards and one man was, was hit in the, in the hand or finger or something and then they returned, then the ATF returned fire. So, the then, so then it came out in trial that the, the gunfire emanated from inside the, the building. That's the only testimony there was because the defendants in that trial didn't testify and of course I was not allowed nor, uh, to give any uh, testimony about what someone else said because of the rule against hearsay so so uh, uh, the information I have imported to you today well, uh, we and that Dick know is, that is there new. was gunfire that came from inside the building through the wall through the through the door not through the wall through, through the, the walls. door sure gunfire came from inside that building through the walls and I think we probably all of us and tens of millions of people across this country had seen that I'd seen that probably on the 6.30 news. 
on February 28th when one of the ATF agents yes. backed away from that window, that I surmised the window in the upper left-hand corner, right. came around to the side of that, that window, and we saw shots coming from the inside out. And I believe you may have been shot. Absolutely, because we were in that room, and we saw both entry and exit holes in that, in that wall up there. I'm sorry, I thought you earlier were talking about the initial flurry. No. The, but back and finish that answer, sure. please. Yes, yes, please. What, what, when we interviewed people and, and walked through that area up there, it was clear uh, that what you see on the video where they uh, break and rake, he, he knocks the glass out, throws in a, uh, a grenade, a concussion grenade, and then they come inside, and then he started shooting by his own testimony. He sprayed the area, and he, uh, he hit somebody back behind one of those walls. We talked to that person's name. His name was Scott Sanobi. And he said, I returned the fire. There was an exchange in there. And then other agents came in there and, and started shooting. And one fellow was wounded. And in the back corner, we could see the blood stains. And there was an exchange. Clearly, rounds were coming from the inside out on that exchange. And we don't know who hit the man still out on the roof. It could have been the agent who was shooting back. It could have been Mr. Sanobi. We Thank just don't know. We'll probably you. never know. Clarification, Thank if you. I might. It was not that window. It's a different side of the building, not that window. That picture doesn't show it. I stand for that. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Collins from Illinois for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield to Ms. Slaughter of New York. I thank the gentleman. All of my time. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Collins, for yielding to me. Uh, Mr. DeGarren, would you remind me for just a moment the date at which David Corris told you that he was relieved and everybody was happy that they didn't have to go through Armageddon? April 14th. Um, on April 13, uh, I think you mentioned here that the negotiator talked about reading by candlelight, and Mr. Zimmerman said that every room had the Coleman lantern. Is that, that about correct, about the yes, same sir. time? And um, it appears here that in conversation that your client, Mr. Schneider, Mr. Zimmerman, believed that he could live in fire, walk through it, and come out surviving. I think he was quoting there a biblical text, ma'am. That he believed that. I, I can't get inside someone's head to say whether they really physically, you know, literally believe. Well, his wife, not. Judy Schneider, said mm -hmm. that the book of Daniel reports that God saved Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the flames of the fiery furnace, and that they were in no way, either of them, afraid of dying by that fire. I right. believe that's true, that they were not afraid to die for their religious beliefs. And this was on about April 13th. How does that coincide with the fact that they were so relieved they didn't have to do it? We, at the last day of Passover was the 13th. Mr. DeGuerre and I came up there, and, and the FBI hooked us up with a telephone conversation, and Steve Schneider said that we'd had to call back after sundown uh, because it was the last day of their High Holy Week. And when we called them that night, Mr. Koresh did not come to the phone. Frankly, it irritated both Mr. Garen and me. Mm -hmm. And that was when we found out the next day was when he was working on the first seal. Well, do you know James Trim? Are you familiar with that name? Who, ma'am? James Trim. That's the not a name. The researcher from Dallas, Fort Worth, who had the endorsement of theologian Philip Arnold, who I believe will testify here later today, that they had a plausible theory about the start of the fire. And this was after the Passover. On the morning of April 19th, Mr. Trim postulates, Koresh ignited the fatal fire at Mount Carmel as a means of closing the fifth seal and ushering in the sixth. So he believed that this fire was necessary in order to get into the sixth seal. Um, and that Koresh had talked to the FBI before about a wall of fire. Did you and your client discuss this? We did not discuss fire, ma'am. Uh, now, Mr. Zimmerman, I think that... Uh, Oh, let's see, they were talking about being taken up by the flames of fire, that this is what they were going to do. Um, there's nothing in any of this, and I have, you've noticed we don't have any props. And frankly, I haven't seen either one of your testimony. I know one was probably laying here this morning, so I have no clue. And I'm sort of trying to go by this as we go along. But from everything that I have, there's no indication from anybody else that's covered this, including FBI negotiators, that at any point Mr. Koresh had said, this is wonderful. I'm going to finish my work here today, and we're not going to have to die. Well, that's not correct. That's not right. If you read the letter that's uh, attached to, to, to I don't my have statement, it. so it's if you the could, last, maybe uh, you could share that with me. That yes, would be nice. It's the last uh, uh, 
exhibit. Are you, are you uh, familiar with the fact that Mr. Porish had said to the FBI that they would again have this wall of fire, which he and his believers thought that they would survive? No. No, and I don't think that that was meant the way you are implying, ma'am, and I know you're just reading from somebody else's book, because, see, the F FBI knew about that. If those are tapes from the negotiations, we know that they didn't really think that that was a very realistic prospect because they made no preparations what for the fire on April the 19th. That they would live through the fire? You don't think that's realistic, that they would live through the fire? Do I personally? No, ma'am, I don't. Well, let, let's talk about that, ma'am, because you'd said a while ago that, uh, that you, Corish, always told the truth. Isn't that correct? I didn't say, Corish, always told the truth. What I was contesting was an allegation that once the lawyers was in, were involved, that Mr. Koresh had promised to come out and had broken that promise. My, my testimony is that once Dick DeGuerin started represent, representing David Koresh and I started representing Steve Schneider, there was never a date certain given about them coming out. And the closest it came to a promise to actually come out is in that letter that's attached to his written statement. Mr. I, I believe opening Mr. Statement. Schumer at least was implying that the tapes that the FBI had I have, dispute that. You know, I have not seen that April 2nd tape, so I don't know what, what's on there, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I would I, like I'm to see it to if know, it's an issue. I, I, I think you'll agree with me that, that Mr. Koresh was a very charismatic man. Yes, he was. Absolutely. In order to get 80 people to believe, first that the men believe that they had to give their wives and their daughters to Koresh, that takes a great leap of faith, doesn't it? Wouldn't you say? Would either one of you want to do that? No, I Neither one. Was Mr. Koresh, did I, you I have to go on Mr. record Koresh? saying were no, ma'am. Were you no, part of <laughs> Yeah? You don't want to say that on the record? I, I, I have to. You didn't oh, give me a chance to. you're going to have to go home. <laughs> I got to. Uh-oh, is that your wife behind That's my you? wife. That's my new grandmother. Would you like me to develop this further? <laughs> uh, <laughs> if I were in court, I'd say let the record reflect that yes, I said no. Yes, well, I'm not a lawyer, so what do I know? Uh, but I, I, the, the thing that really astonishes me here is that both of you are so certain that this man was telling you the truth. I, I think he you was. You know, I, I, I'm absolutely flummoxed by that as to why well, you think that Corey, who told people that they could walk through fire and survive, well, and that know they that should give them that. all of their worldly goods, and they should hand over their wives and daughters, and that, and that he was going to take them somewhere. Frankly, I've never been able to understand this whole thing. After they burned up in the fire, what next? I mean, I, I, I don't know to what end they wanted to burn up. But, ne but never mind, let me say, I'm baffled because I know you guys are great lawyers because Jean Green told me you are. And, and, you know, and I know that's true. But tell me. I she really, never asked the question. I, yes, I did. Okay. I well, want to know it. what makes you so certain in face of everything else you've ever heard about this man that well, he was telling the know. two of you the truth. Well. I, I can answer that. What he told me that I was able to confirm, that were, was capable of being confirmed, I confirmed. And it turned out to be true. What was that? Well, there's several things, and, and I can give you several examples. I'd love to hear. When right. Robert Rodriguez, just, just one question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> when Robert Rodriguez testified here, it was the first time I'd heard Robert Rodriguez describe the conversation that he had with Corish. And he said Corish he would never be taken again. described it exactly right? the same way, except for that. Right. When so I heard, how does that chime, though? He said, I will never be taken again. This is his truthful man. They've had me once. They'll never take me again. And the two of you believe you talked him into being taken? What's the question? Uh, that, is that, that, that's really what I'm saying. Do you believe that after you negotiated with him, he was willing to give up? Uh, this thing that he had said to his followers and in the presence of Robert Rodriguez, I will never be taken again, and you had talked him into being well, taken again. First, I, I'm a little doubtful that he said it that way to Robert Rodriguez. Everything else that Robert said, everything w w jived with exactly what Corey said. And I talked to a number of people that were in the room. Steve Schneider was one of them. Judy Schneider was another one of them. It was in the room when that conversation with David, between David Corish and Robert Rodriguez took place. They all describe it the same way as Robert Rodriguez did, except for that statement, I'll never be taken again. There were other statements that he said to me that I found to be true. The one about Henry McMahon. He told me exactly about the statement with Henry McMahon, who testified that he um, had given the phone, or tried to give the phone to Davy Aguilera or Corish to say, come on out and look at the guns if you want to. It was described the same way. 
there were many other, if you want me to go into them, I, I will. Time has expired. Should, am I supposed to answer that too, sir? Thank you very much. Uh, if, if you can do it in a fairly short period of time. I don't great. want to repeat anything because of the shortness of the time, but you asked why I believed him given all these walk through fire and survive fire. Let, let me handle this very delicately, but truthfully, it's the only way I know to do it. I'm of the Jewish faith. There are a lot of tenets of religion in, the, in other Christian SECTs sex other than the uh, Branch Davidians that frankly I find hard sometimes that other people believe and literally believe uh, I mean tr believe to be literally true yet when those people who believe that tell me something I still believe them because they are I find them to be truthful people in other ways and I don't I don't assess credibility on their religious beliefs. Now, everybody's religious belief is separately. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, it seems okay. to me you, uh, you'd have to say that, that he had not told your client the truth. I think your time is well expired. Mr. Blute. did not survive. Five minutes. Okay. Not to mind now. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the witnesses. I think uh, your testimony is very important because of your firsthand interaction with Koresh and the Davidians during the uh, siege period. Uh, I think one of the more uh, tragic uh, parts of this whole episode were the missed opportunities along the way to avoid this tragedy. We've already heard testimony, for example, that the ATF uh, were offered a chance to, by Koresh himself, on the phone to come out and inspect the weapons. Uh, they chose not to. They said it was too early in the investigation. Earlier, Mr. Thibodeau, a Davidian, testified that he felt that uh, Koresh had such a uh, reasonable relationship with the local sheriff that perhaps if the local sheriff came out and brought the warrant, uh, we might have had a different type of situation. Uh, we also know that after the raid, when the siege started, the initial negotiator was getting through to Koresh and they had a kind of relationship intellectually that allowed numerous people to be released during that period and that for some unknown reason, and I hope to find that out later with the FBI, that negotiator was taken off summarily and replaced with someone else who did not have that uh, relationship and no one else was ever released uh, uh, again. Uh, so I think there are a lot of missed opportunities. You have a unique perspective in that you uh, had some negotiations with Koresh and with the Davidians at this time. I wonder if you could just briefly discuss what you think were the important uh, missed opportunities during that period? Well, um, I, I think that you have to look at the tactics of the FBI as creating missed opportunities. In the first place, each time someone would come out, and mo it, I, I, I dispute the, the term release. I, I think the people came out when they wanted to come out. No one was being held against their will during the 51-day standoff. That's all I know about. Each time someone came out, the treatment that they got was calculated to discourage anyone else coming out. When the children were released or came out, they were put into custody of uh, Child Protective Services, even when they came out with their parents. They were separated from their parents. They were, the, their religious and dietary wishes were not responded to. When adults came out, every one of them went to jail and were not allowed to make bond. For instance, the first two ladies that came out, one of them was 77 years old and practically blind. She was charged with a false affidavit with having participated in the shooting that occurred on February the 28th. Uh, an agent actually testified that she held a gun and pointed it. She's, uh, she, she just couldn't have done it. When the, those on the inside who were seeing the news report saw the treatment that people were getting when they went outside, well, it discouraged them from going outside. So there was this, this tension going on between the, the tactical men who were uh, trying to force a conclusion and treating those who were released uh, in ways not to encourage release as opposed to the negotiators who were trying to establish trust and rapport. You know anything about this initial negotiator on the phone that was replaced uh, 
Yes. Could you comment on that? Uh, well, uh, what I know uh, is what partially I was told by David, uh, and that is that initially there was a man named James Cavanaugh with the ATF who David said he uh, had a, a, a relationship with. I don't know how you can establish a relationship over the phone, but he said that he trusted the man and that they were able to talk, and they talked kind of the same language. I've seen the tapes of that, and, and Kavanaugh uses some biblical terms, and he uses some, I love your brother, that sort of thing, it, which is, you got to question that coming from an ATF agent who's just seen four of his friends killed and others wounded. And, but that beyond, beyond that, there was a trust that was established there and he was taken off. I think that was because the FBI came in and, and, they, and they should have pushed the ATF out of the way. But I think there was also some trust established with the FBI negotiators. I talked to several of them and they were good. Uh, they're behavioral scientists and they, they're engaging men to talk to. They're nice. They're not the kind of uh, beat on your chest uh, uh, Rambo types. Let me uh, ask Mr. Zimmerman uh, what you think were the greatest missed opportunities during this period. Uh, I think you're going to talk to Clint Van Zandt. He, he was uh, the negotiator that I had the most contact with, and I thought he had his head on straight. He, in other words, when, when the Branch Davidians did something that we wanted, all of us wanted them to do, like when somebody came out or something like that, instead of rewarding that, make, making things better so it would encourage that kind of conduct, they would do things like play sound tapes of rabbits being slaughtered or uh, uh, Nancy Sinatra singing songs. And, and then they would bring out lights uh, at night. And uh, not, not that Nancy Sinatra always was that bad, but the ones that she had kept. The point was this. They were trying to have sleep disturbance, and they were trying to take somebody that they viewed to be unstable to start with, and then they were trying to drive him crazy. And then they get mad because he does something that they think is irrational. I mean, that's I think, was the mistake made there. They should have backed the lights away, stopped taking, stopped the noise. When they gave Dick the letter, gave us the letter, they should have withdrawn all of that so it could show them, hey, this is what we want to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Inspired. We're going to go two on our side by previous agreement on the other side. Mr. Bryant, you have five minutes. Thank you. Gentlemen, if you could, I have a number of questions, and if you could keep your answers relatively short, I'd appreciate it. Did both of you go into the compound at various times? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Were either of you searched as you went in by the Davidians? Yes. By the Davidians? Oh, no, yeah. sir. By the FBI. The Davidians treated us as guests. Okay. So they didn't, they weren't suspicious of you enough to search you for war weapons or anything like that? The, no. the Davidians? The Davidians. No, sir. Right. And you were searched before you went in by the FBI? And as I came out. And as you came out. Okay. Now, uh, in reading some of the correspondence, Mr. DeGarren, I noticed that you attempted to establish a relationship with the local United States Attorney's Office uh, in terms of negotiation. And having been involved in that type of experience myself, uh, I know that oftentimes a defense attorney will be more likely to deal with the other attorneys, the U.S. attorney in this case, or assistants, than, than you actually deal with the law enforcement. Anytime, either one of you, did you have a relationship where you asked to deal with U.S. attorneys, or even more, was a specific, special U.S. attorney sent down from Washington? No. No, in fact, I couldn't get uh, phone calls returned. The FBI was far more responsive to me than U.S. Attorney's Office. I tried to serve, a, just take a courtesy copy of the writ of habeas corpus up to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and they wouldn't even let me poke it through the, the glass window. And also, sir, we didn't know at the time initially whether this can be a federal prosecution or a state prosecution because Texas law of capital murder carries a death penalty and at that time I don't believe uh, it, the decision had been made whether or not to proceed with the state prosecution or a federal prosecution at the initial stages. Did you ever see a uh, again a, a, a United States attorney uh, from DC a DOJ attorney down at Waco during this time? No I did not. Okay, let me move on to another question if I could. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman you testified early today that you felt that there were the details of a voluntary surrender had been worked out and in fact you detailed specifically how that would occur. Let me ask you to detail for the record as, as best you can who you made that deal with and when that deal was made. Now, give me names of people up the line that you negotiated this deal with because I want to ask these people what they saw. I, I don't know if I would call it a deal. The, the parameters were 
gi given to us by the FBI, and I, I'm, Dick, you can correct me. I, I think it was Jeff Jamar. It, it might have been. Uh, what it, it was I think it, Jeff Jamar. Usually, Jeff Jamar and Bob Ricks were together every time. They were always there, and one said something, and not the other. But I think it was Jeff Jamar, and. Uh, you know, they made a lot of sense. There wasn't a whole lot of fine-tuning needed. Like I said, the only thing that we, that I can remember asking them to change was to let the little children come out with their mothers, and they didn't have a problem with that. So the FBI gave you the, the details you've talked about. You would, uh, Mr. DeGarren would come out first with Mr. Koresh. Uh, they would put on plastic handcuffs and go through metal detectors, and Mr. Zimmerman, you would come out last. This is a detailed plan the FBI had given you? It's all oral. It was all oral. In fact, between the date of April 1st when we went in together for the first time on April 4th, I put, I started to write that out uh, so that we could get it typed up and get it writing, <laughs> which never, never did occur because, um, I, I don't know, I think it sort of got put to the side. We were more concerned with getting them out because uh, they had already agreed to those terms. Both, both sides had agreed to those terms, the FBI and the Branch Davidians. I'll ask those people some more about that when they testify. Mr. Zimmerman, you asked a question that, that piqued my interest and you really didn't get the chance to answer it or you didn't get a chance to answer the question about you were alluding to the fact that the FBI did not, you felt like they did not anticipate that a fire would occur because they had made no preparations to, to fight fire, to have... Right. I was trying to answer uh, Mrs. Slaughter's question and I was saying that the way I, the way I interpreted that transaction was is that the references to fire that Steve and the others that were talking to him on the telephone was, was quoting biblical scriptures and, and clearly not some threat to have a fire. And I think one indicia of that is, or one uh, evidentiary thing you can look at is, is that the FBI certainly didn't take it seriously. Uh, if they did, would they have, well, I, in my judgment they didn't because if they thought that there was going to be a fire on April the 19th as a result of them smashing the building with tanks and inserting tear, uh, what they call tear gas, which I call CS gas, not tear gas, they wouldn't have done it. Geez, we'd hope they wouldn't have done it. I mean, the innocent okay. kids in there would get burned up. Let me ask you uh, another line of questions real quickly, uh, and I have to hold this back where I can read. Uh, Peter Smerrick, are you familiar with him as the FBI, one of the psychological people did you have any, either one of you have any dealings with Mr. Smerrick? I understand he, he gave some opinions, three or four opinions to, to basically counsel like you're doing to hold back and wait, but that the fifth opinion he gave was that uh, let's go in and have the confrontation. All I know is that I have read what he had allegedly counseled and that he was pressured to change that, and then he left the area. I never met him. I never met uh, him. Just real quickly. Uh, well, I tell you what, I'll, I'll be generous and yield back the balance all, the, all of my time there. Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Sh Mr. Shabbat, take, take the balance of your time. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Zimmerman, uh, in response to my question uh, about what are the lessons of Waco that we should learn earlier, um, you mentioned leadership accountability. Uh, would you please expound upon what you meant by that? I am, you know, I was trained and raised on the theory that uh, as a military commander, I'm responsible for everything that happens in my unit. And then when I get assigned a mission, if I accomplish the mission, the credit goes to the troops. But if I fail in the mission, it's my responsibility. Because I'm supposed to make sure everybody's trained and that we accomplish the mission. I, I, I think that unless the oversight process that you're going through here results in some leadership changes, we're going to have people still in the position that they were in before this Waco fiasco making the same kind of bad judgment calls. In other words, once we have a commander who has demonstrated that he cannot react under stress and, and respond appropriately, we relieve him of command and we put somebody else in there that can. We owe it to our troops. And, and I, I have the same feeling for those young ATF agents, and if you read my written opening statement, I, I, I don't know that I would concur with calling them heroes in the sense that they were just carrying out orders. They probably don't think they're heroes, but I'll take Rodriguez in a minute as a troop. He'll do what he's supposed to do. And, and he is entitled to, and people like him are entitled to leaders that plan better, and when those plans go awry like they did, they need to be relieved of their command and not just put somewhere else and kept on the payroll. The Justice Department didn't even do as much as the Treasury Department did. 
There's been no accountability. I tried to use an example uh, from the military. Let, let me tell you one of the ironies of this case. On April the 19th, 1993, the day of this fire, the United States Court of Military Appeals, a civilian court that's the highest court in the military justice system, affirmed the conviction of a Marine officer for dereliction of duty because he left a training exercise and left one of his men in the desert and that man expired, he died. And that man was charged with dereliction of duty for the loss of one life through a pure mistake, but he was responsible. And on that same day, 80 people died in Waco, Texas because improper decisions, bad judgment was made, no conspiracy, no intentional killing, but incompetence. And there has not been even a disciplinary, administrative disciplinary action taken by anybody in the Justice Department, and that's wrong. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mrs. Thurman for five minutes. Mr. Zimmerman, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been involved with the federal employees negotiations at all, ever? Federal as employees as, uh, negotiations? Because you're talking an awful lot about what happened with ATF or what you would have done in firing those or getting rid of some of those people. So have you been involved in any of the personnel, federal employee acts at all? You mean as a civilian? Yes. No, ma'am. Okay. I, well, let, I, me, let me just... It's harder let me, than what I said, I, I know. And it is, and, and I think you ought to run for Congress because you, you sound... <laughs> but let me just suggest to you that Mr. McGaw did in fact, and, and one of the reasons that he was very concerned, basically very similar to what you're saying, he felt they were, they were not right either, but when they did put them back into office, that they put them back into a non-supervisory, couldn't wear their guns, couldn't do anything, because they were concerned that if, in fact, uh, they were put back on through trial, that they would be able to be reinstated back at the level that they were. Now that, and I, and I am not an attorney, nor I am a federal employee negotiator, so I'm just giving you the example of what they said. I don't disagree with you, but I will say Mr. Hartnett is gone, um, has resigned, and Sarabin and Hosnowski were the two that had sued and filed suit. So, and we don't know what happened there, okay? But so I, I, so I think we need to be very careful in, that that they haven't tried to take disciplinary action, okay? One of your one of your fellow committee members though asked, is there any legislation action that you sure. can take? Geez, if that's the law, ladies and gentlemen, okay. change the law. No question. Let me, um, Mr. Guerin, you actually were Mr. Koresh's attorney. Correct. Yes, How many total hours did you spend with him, do you think, in the period of time that you represented him? About 32 hours. About 32 hours. Okay. Based as, on those hours, you've come to some conclusions that, that he would have come out um, after he completed the seven seals. Is that correct? No, ma'am. No, it's based on a lot more than that 32 hours. Okay. That, could you tell just me briefly action. what it was based on then? Oh, sure. It was based on the uh, month approximate a month or so that I spent as his attorney and um, trying to learn all the issues and the facts, consulting with the religious experts, talking to the FBI, going to the scene, seeing all the things I did. It's not just the 32 hours that I spent okay. in some kind of direct contact. Did you also speak to any other members of uh, the Davidians who had since left? Yes, I did. Could you tell me who they were? Rita Riddle, for one. I spoke to her uh, during the standoff, uh, not directly to Catherine Schroeder, but to her lawyer, uh, to Brad ba Branch, uh, who, was, uh, who had uh, come out early, to Livingston Fagan, uh, who was probably the most knowledgeable about the religious about issues. About Mark Rowe or uh, no. Ms. Buns or any of those no. that had been interviewed at all who had suggested. Just one of the things that has concerned me in, in listening to some of this is that we've heard different testimony over the last several days um, that the consensus among the psychiatrists on the scene, experts from the FBI whom you talked with as well, um, that Koresh potentially was suicidal. Uh, Joyce Sparks, who spent more time, I think, about two and a half months, I mean, talking to him uh, back and forth on his religious beliefs, testified that it would have been contradictory to his teachings to surrender. Uh, you know, Miss Jewell, who lived most of her life, uh, testified and, and said the details would change, which you said earlier in your testimony that he kept, you know, coming back with other excuses or reasons why, but she said in her testimony that the details would change as David received more messages from God 
but there was never a time when he didn't expect to be killed by the feds. You need to know that. The same thing that Mrs. Buns had said, um, she, was, she was not happy with, uh, obviously, with Mr. Koresh, but she basically said uh, in the articles that we have, The Sinful Messiah, that he would use the law when it backs up something he wanted to say, but when it didn't, he'd just explain it away. Um, she went on to say, um, this is Jewel, Miss Jewel, we didn't expect to be killed by the feds who David said were Babylon or that we would be expected. Based on this information, okay, and based on all of this testimony that we've had, a reasonable conclusion for the negotiators was that Koresh would never come out. I'm, based on what you've said today, what I've heard in the past, I'm having a hard time reconciling, reconciling your suggestions and what I've heard over on the other side. I mean, could we agree maybe that there is a possibility here that what you believe is one thing, what other beliefs are out there too? I mean, that maybe Mr. Koresh did have and had other ways of believing than what we're seeing here today? Sure. Okay. I, I mean, I think that's important. Um, the set, one of the other things I need to bring up here is that you all had mentioned Paul Gray, uh, and I guess we had this thing up here. It, um, it is my understanding, just so you'll know, maybe you all can clarify this, but this is what we've been told, that he actually never worked for ATF, that he actually worked for um, the city of Houston as an arson investigator, and even during the time that he was the arson investigator, he worked for the Houston Fire Department but he may have, his phone number may have been there, but never was he paid by, does that say special agent on yes, there? Yes, it does. Now, it does say right, that? Though, he was paid, my understanding was, he still was on the Houston Fire Department payroll. He was assigned to, the, to an ATF task force. To a task force. Correct. But his office was in the ATF. He carried at this card. But he was there for the purpose of the Houston Fire Department to carry out the arson investigation because he had had 25 years in this right. area. Is that correct? I don't know about that. I know for eight years he gave out this card saying he's an ATF agent. If we're trying to get somebody impartial, we could have gone to Miami or Philadelphia sure. or Los Angeles, but if you, but not that. But Mr. McGarren, could I respond to that briefly? Sure. There, I know uh, a lot of people in the Houston Fire Department Arson Division. I've got some friends there, and I learned more about it as time went on, just through my friends. There's at least ten other very qualified arson experts at the Houston Fire Department that could have, that did not have that connection to the ATF. And why, why Houston uh, even then? There are arson investigators all around the country that don't have the ties. What I'm saying is that doesn't pass a smell test. I don't know um, about Mr. Gray's motives, but what I do is about the appearance. And we'll be uh, hearing from them so that we can clarify this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chair now wishes to recognize Mr. Barr for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like uh, to uh, direct uh, the attention of uh, both Mr. Zimmerman and uh, Mr. DeGarren to uh, three documents. I'm not sure whether, whether you all have these. Uh, if not, Mr. Bush, if you could distribute these. These relate, uh, gentlemen, to uh, a discussion that has uh, come up uh, virtually every day because it concerns uh, at best a spin control that began uh, in the immediate aftermath of the February 28th raid and continues even today with uh, as, as reflected in some of the complaints by some of my colleagues here concerning statements by the White House uh, and our efforts to uh, to get the facts out in, in these hearings. The first one, and, and I'm going to uh, go down here uh, and draw your attention to the chart, which uh, have some blow-ups of these uh, uh, documents and the relevant language prepared by one of your colleagues, Mr. Evans, when you were here just the other day. Has there been any impression on your part that these are props and whatnot? He, he, he had these blown up because they were right interesting language to him. And what I'd like to know is, in your opinion, and I'd like to look at all three of these very quickly and then ask you, uh, in your opinion, if both of you have, I think, uh, fairly uh, common knowledge, uh, uh, sorry, you have extensive experience in handling criminal, criminal matters in federal court. Uh, the first document is contained in the first one we have there, which is dated uh, March 1, 1993, and it indicates that immediately upon initiating the, uh, the shooting review by ATF, the stories uh, did not end up by the agents, and there were instructions from Mr. Johnston 
the assistant United States attorney is in control, at least initially, of the, uh, the investigation from the prosecution standpoint, uh, directed that the, uh, that the interview stop. Uh, because uh, they didn't want to create heaven forbid Brady material that might be exculpatory, we certainly don't want to do that. Uh, and then uh, when notified that there was an interview that had to go forward, that is document indicates that Johnson, Johnson authorized it, but no notes were to be created, uh, no prayer. The second document, which is also blown up here, uh, concerns the, the second one. The relevant language here uh, indicates very clearly that the Treasury Department was reflecting DOJ, Department of Justice's uh, request uh, that uh, no interviews or discussions with any of the participants who may be potential witnesses uh, be conducted here again. The fear is, heaven forbid, that we might, uh, that we might uh, generate some, some information that would call into chance for or detail, which basically, as you all are much more aware of than I am, concerns information that might be mitigating or exculpatory. Uh, and it would at some point in a prosecution have to be turned over to the defense pursuant to the constitutional uh, edicts of uh, due process and protection. And the third document here, <coughs> uh, this, this continues on the second one there. The third one is uh, some handwritten notes that we have not yet been able to determine who these belong. Uh, indicates that Mr. Ray Young, who I think you're both familiar with, who was the assistant U.S. attorney that eventually took over the prosecution of the, of the actual case, does not want uh, these individuals uh, re-interviewed because uh, they do not want to uh, uh, produce any more exculpatory statements. Uh, it is my impression as a former United States attorney, some members of this panel, very learned members of this panel, have indicated it's not their impression also with federal criminal procedure, that this is not standard government understanding operating procedure. Uh, other uh, members on the other side uh, indicate that, that this is uh, just uh, uh, this standard operating procedure that immediately upon initiating a shooting review, designed as we have elicited from Mr. Johnston himself, designed to search for the truth and uncover evidence to determine whether or not something went wrong, uh, they feel that it is standard operating procedure for the Department of Justice to come in and shut that investigation down. In your experiences, uh, Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. McGarren, does this comport either with the search for the truth uh, or with standard Department of Justice procedures? No, sir. No, sir. Uh, any, uh, would you care to expand on that one? And let me also tell you, uh, by way of uh, background on that particular question, your colleague, Mr. Tim Evans, who was here uh, the other day, went over these at some length because he had been sitting in the audience on Wednesday and Thursday when we initially discussed these documents and on his own. Uh, had been brought up because he was so flabbergasted to hear testimony uh, that, or, an, or efforts to uh, put into the record that these reflect standard Department of Justice procedures to close down a search for the truth, uh, that he, uh, he stated, and we went into some detail on Friday, that this was certainly not his impression. Yet then again, we came back yesterday and Mr. Uh, Mr. Noble, uh, Ron Noble, uh, uh, who is a very forceful individual, some would say uh, intimidating individual, uh, said this is absolutely uh, standard procedure, and he could state that from his background being with not only the Department of Justice, but the Department of Treasury, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, there certainly are times, are there not, when it's important for a prosecutor to step in and make sure, for example, that public statements are not made that might impinge or infringe or prejudice a, uh, an investigation or prosecution. Is that correct? I, I see a distinction between a prosecutor asking the investigators not to make public statements and, n and telling an investigator not to do something that might develop evidence that could be favorable to the defense. If the first thing is not wrong, that is telling an investigator not to talk to the press. The second thing is clearly wrong. If an investigation is impeded by a prosecutor telling an investigator, don't go interview somebody or don't take notes if you do. I ask this because the light just went on so you can reflect this in your continuing answer. Uh, would this reflect in, this, in your mind these documents, an effort to impede an investigation or possible obstruction of justice? Well, it could be. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm qualifying my answer because uh, it's, it's shocking to see this in the first place. As a defense lawyer, Sometimes we suspect that there's stuff like that going on. But there is an absolute duty 
that a prosecutor has to turn over to the defense any evidence that is arguably favorable to the defendant. It's just a matter of fair play because the investigators that investigate a case usually are on the prosecution side and they develop most of the evidence. But when you tell, when a prosecutor tells an investigator, don't develop evidence or don't take notes if you do because it might be helpful to the defense, that ain't right. Gentlemen's time has expired. I'll be quick, Mr. Chairman. Two quick observations. One, I've never seen anything like this in writing. I'm shocked that they put it in writing right, and left a trail. Uh, second, I note that this always seems to be on the receiving end of somebody else's instructions. In other words, this seems to be, each of these three documents seems to be recording what the, de what the Department of Justice wants the Treasury or the ATF to do as opposed to initiating itself. So if I were the defense lawyer in this situation, I would ask for a hearing and I'd get people in under oath and find out who was it that said this? Who gave you these directions? What did they tell you to do? Because these all look like they are recording what instructions somebody gave from Johnson, from Jan, and from the Department of Justice. These aren't Department of Justice documents. These are somebody else's documents is the point I'm getting at. So we'd want to make sure that that's what was really said. And it sure looks like what they said. I mean, I don't know why somebody would not record this accurately, but uh, it doesn't pass a smell test either. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Lofgren from California, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman. I um, appreciate being here now. Uh, the Science Committee also had the markup of the uh, NASA authorization this morning, so as with some members, I have been running back and forth. Uh, at this time, I would like to yield four of my five minutes to um, Mr. Schumer and the remaining minute to uh, Ms. Jackson Lee. Okay. Sure. Thank you. I want to thank the gentlelady from California. I just found it a little ironic, Mr. Zimmerman, you complained that they uh, had gotten someone who, wasn't par who was partial because he was part of the ATF, and here we have two very fine, admittedly, defense lawyers whose job is not to be partial, taking our whole six hours here, and uh, I find that a little bit ironic. I would first like to ask you, Mr. Zimmerman, you mentioned that Mr. Schneider was a peaceful man. And the whole impression that both you and Mr. DeGaron are giving is that David Koresh was a rational, reasonable person. Mr. DeGaron said, well, let's assume he had kooky religious views. But I think from everything we've heard, Mr. Koresh was not simply somebody with different religious views. Would you admit that Mr. Koresh was a criminal? Mr. Zimmerman, you can answer that yes or no. I don't think it's been proved, but I think there's evidence of that. How about you? That's a good defense lawyer answer, <laughs> Mr. Zimmerman. How about you, Mr. DeGaron? I'd, I'd agree with that. I think that okay. if, if true what's been said about him, he was um, uh, guilty of a lot of crimes. Right. And do you consider somebody who is part of a group that stockpiles 48 illegal weapons, hundreds of hand grenades, peaceful? I Mr. don't think Zimmerman? Steve, no, I certainly don't. I don't okay. think Steve Snyder was involved in that. I see, but you wouldn't consider Mr. Koresh peaceful. That's the first time I've heard that there's been stockpiles of hundreds of grenades. Well, let's just sir. say he had 48 illegal weapons and some illegal hand grenades. Would you consider that peaceful? I think it's a violation of law. He's criminal. Do you, but you didn't answer my question. You made the comment, you brought the word up peaceful, that Mr. Schneider, who's one of his chief people, I don't want to use lieutenant because you didn't like that word, what would you like me, what word would you like me to use? He described Mr. Koresh as a teacher of teachers and he okay, was a teacher. Okay, one of his students, his pupils, right. uh, one of his main pupils as peaceful. I'm asking you about Mr. Koresh on, his, on the, and we won't even call it a compound, on Mount Carmel where they had 48 illegal machine guns and at least a quantity of illegal hand grenades, would you consider Mr. Koresh peaceful? Yes or no? The way you say that, probably no. No. What do you mean the way I say it? Well, because I'd do like you, to know what they Let me ask you this, for. Mr. Zimmerman. It's my time. Do you dispute okay. those facts? Do you say it's not been proven that there were 48 illegal machine guns and a bunch 
of illegal hand grenades on his compound? I believe there were 48 illegal uh, automatic weapons on April the 19th. I don't that's know correct. that that's the case on February 28th, sir. Right, but we're talking about April 19th. Right, April okay. 19th, no question. That, okay, and didn't you, you know about the trial? Didn't many or at least several Branch Davidians testify that there were these weapons there and that on the morning of February 28th, there was preparation to give those weapons out and to shoot? Let's strike and to shoot. There were those weapons there, and there was all sorts of preparation. The names of the people who testified, as I believe, one was Schroeder. I don't have my notes here in front of me. Isn't that correct? Sir, I believe there was testimony that weapons were there and that they were distributed. I don't recall right any before. testimony about anything but illegal weapons, so. I see, but there were weapons there. Yes. How about hand grenades? Was there testimony about that? I or were they just... I don't know. I don't recall that. Do you recall, Mr. DeGarren? No, I don't know any... Even though you know every other detail about the trial. That's not fair, Mr. Schumer. Well, let me ask you. You don't recall that. Do you believe... So, in other words, you have no... You doubt that there were 48 illegal weapons and I've hand grenades I've never said there? I knew all the details of the trial. Do you I've doubt that? I'm asking that you that peaceful. right now, sir. What is your question? My question is, do you doubt... Do you have doubts that Mr. Koresh had on his compound illegal weapons and illegal hand grenades. No, Do you have any doubts about that? No, he told Thank me you. he had illegal okay. weapons Do you there. Have he doubts did not th tell me that he had hand grenades there. I see. And I okay. saw no hand, hand grenades. I did see some grenades that the ATF had thrown in, and I brought one out. What do you mean the, thrown in? The ATF threw in grenades in their dynamic no, they didn't throw entry, any Mr. grenades Mr. in, as I yes, understand they did. it. They I brought flash, one out. They were flash packs. They did have not Have you ever explode. seen what a flash bang can do to somebody? It can tear your arm off. Okay, it, sir. They were not grenades. Would you yes, stipulate they were, yes, they that? Were grenades. You believe they were grenades? They were grenades. Okay. I brought one out to the okay. FBI and you turned see, it I, over to them. Right. Okay, Mr. DeGarren. I think that would hamper your credibility because you're the first person who would say that those were grenades. Let me ask you uh, this May question. May I answer that? Do you have any... I'd like to ask the question simply because I have five minutes. Today, I'm the lawyer well, you and said you're something the witness, about my sir. credibility. Today, I'm and the I'd lawyer like to talk and you're the witness, about sir. That, Mr. Schumer. Okay. Let me ask you this. Do you have any doubts that David Koresh had illegal sexual relationships with some of the people at the compound? I don't know. You don't know? You have no knowledge of that? I didn't say I had no knowledge. I, I haven't... I don't know. And Do I'm not here the to testimony? defend... Do you doubt the testimony of Kiri Jewell, who yes. was here? Did you hear about that? Yes, I do. Yes. You doubt that? Yes. Do you doubt that, Mr. Yes, Zimmerman? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you, do you know why? Yeah, you can tell me why. That, that, we didn't learn of that the first time when that she testified for this hearing. She, she's made... Uh, that, that kind of claim has been made for some time. Her own mother didn't believe that. Her own grandmother didn't believe that. Right. Uh, there's been uh, doubts about prior con contradictory statements that she's made in the past. Now, it may be 100% okay. true. Just it may be 100% my time, true. Because my time is okay. up. In my judgment, in many ways, these witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact about David Koresh. And I'd like to respond uh, to that. Your time, time has expired. May I respond to that? Uh, you can respond relative to the personal comment uh, yes. briefly. Uh, regarding your comment about my credibility, Mr. Schumer, when I went into the compound, uh, I was searched. And when I came back out, I brought to the FBI agents and showed them a spent grenade that's what sometimes euphemistically call a flashbang. It's a grenade. It has an explosive charge in it. It's very dangerous. It can blow your hand off. It can blow your face off. It can kill. I would have brought out some of the unexpended grenades that the ATF threw in, but I was worried about bringing out a live grenade, so I left them there. There were a number of grenades. Wait a second. That is not fair. Okay. And so as to okay. my credibility about that, Mr. Schumer, ask yeah. Jeff Jamar or Byron Sage about the grenade. They will say that they were flash packs, not grenades. Chair recognizes Mr. Shattuck for five minutes. I yielded a minute of my five to Ms. Your time, Jackson. Your time was expired. You had the oh. full five minutes. There was one four minutes and one minute. Mr. So, Schumer you, took all of it plus a little bit. Of Mr. Thank Shattuck. you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this opportunity to question the witnesses. Um, let me say, just as an introductory comment, that um, much has been made here of the issue of whether or not these hearings are intended to criticize law enforcement 
or to attack law enforcement. Indeed, the White House says we are trashing law enforcement, undermining the morale of law enforcement officers, and, and, and is very, very critical of these hearings. Let me tell you, I spent eight years in law enforcement, as I've said before, my father was a deputy sheriff. I do not know a law enforcement officer who believes that when there is a legitimate inquiry into mistakes or into wrongdoing, that that is trashing law enforcement. Having said that, let me say that while uh, one of my colleagues on the, my, on the opposite side might say that you are our witnesses, I uh, beg to differ quite strongly with you on a couple of points. I, didn't, I think the most telling point on the issue of who shot first, and I think that is an unfortunate issue that's come up in these hearings, was uh, Mr. Zimmerman's remark that that question is irrelevant. As I heard Mr. DeGuerin remark, he said there were holes going down and holes coming in the door. Unless you have a time clock and a photograph every minute, which direction the holes come from cannot possibly tell you, in my mind, who shot first. No, you're right. Beyond that, um, the notion that there are, in fact, holes coming down, shots from the helicopters, I will tell you, if I'd been in a helicopter, and I don't know what went on, but if I'd been in a helicopter and a firefighter had started out on my ground and I was an ATF agent, I'd have started firing. Um, because my guys are under fire, by gosh, they're coming under fire. Having said that, the third point I want to make, Mr. Zimmerman, you said there was no ambush because if they had wanted to kill them in the trailers, they could have. Well, I was shocked to see the trailers are just canvas covered, not metal. And it is clear to me that if Koresh had wanted to just blow them away and had known that they were the agents, he could have ambushed them. But then you went on to say that it was your theory that it was an accidental discharge by an agent coming out of the trailer. I'll tell you, the agents I've known in my life are trained not to have accidental discharges, and it is just as plausible a theory in my mind that it was an accidental discharge by a nervous Davidian who was not as well trained to use that firearm. The reason I say that, sir, is that that was information that was given to us by, by uh, someone in the press who had a confidential source within the ATF who indicated that someone said that as he was coming out of the back of that, he tripped, his weapon wasn't on safe, and it discharged. Well, and, and if you look, supposedly, if you looked at the trajectory, the round went into the front of the, of the pickup truck's engine compartment, and it was coming horizontal, and there were no Davidians horizontal, and the only people in front was the other agents. I have no verification of that. Well, with that additional information, that helps. Also, with regard to the shots down, uh, Mr. Uh, DeGuerin. DeGuerin, you indicated that the roof was the highest point in the area. There's been discussion of a tower. Was there not also a tower? That's the same, same thing. Uh, it was called the tower, or the observation tower. It's a fourth floor. It's not shown in this picture, but in, in the diagrams that I've brought, it is shown. It was a fourth floor. Actually, it was a bedroom of David Koresh, and it had almost a flat roof. Okay. I want to go into one other document. Um, Mr. Barr went over two documents with you, uh, which were, uh, have been brought into these hearings, the essence of which is instructions from the Justice Department to ATF agents to stop their shooting review because it was creating Brady review material. The Department of Justice, upon hearing that evidence come into this hearing, issued a press release, and I have this press release here. Uh, we're putting it up there, and you have copies of it. That press release, issued within minutes of the testimony coming into this hearing, says uh, that during the past two days of the congressional hearings on the tragedy at Waco, a long-standing Justice Department practice has been madly, this has been badly mischaracterized. Is, in fact, it a long-standing Justice Department practice, to your knowledge, or have you ever heard of it, that any time Brady material is being created, you instruct people to stop asking questions? No, sir, not at all. Would that uh, be an outrage? It, well, it is outrageous that, that there was an instruction to stop because you might create Brady material. Now, this is a little bit different. It, it, this tries to say that it's such standard procedure that it's prosecution 101. Well, I, I've never been in the Justice Department. I've only been a state prosecutor, and I don't know of any such requirement. I can understand that there might be an effort to stop a congressional investigation that's going on at the same time as a criminal investigation, but two different criminal agencies investigating at the same time, let them at it, let them have it, do it. What? Develop the facts in any way you can. One more quick point. In the second paragraph, it says uh, something about the often request the federal government to temporarily refrain from pursuing an investigation. There's nothing in 
these documents that suggest the request was done just to temporarily refrain, but rather to refrain because they were developing conflicting information. Isn't that right? That's the way I read those memos. I'm running out of time. I'd like you at the last moment, I'd like to ask each of you to summarize, if you would, your views of why you believe, and, and Mr. Zimmerman, you touched on this already, why you believe it was somebody in Washington or somebody other than the people you were dealing with day to day that made what appears to be the illogical decision to pull out the agent who was successfully or appeared to be successfully negotiating um, and the decision to go in at the time they went in. Those two seem to me to be inconsistent with an effort by the FBI to try to resolve this peacefully. I would desperately like to believe that that was their goal. You had to have met a number of FBI agents. You had to have known what they were like. You knew the agents in the field to some degree. Why did they pull out, in your view, the agent who was having success in negotiating, and then why did they make that final decision to go in? Gentlemen, each of you would. I don't know why they pulled. You're talking about Mr. Special Agent Kavanaugh? Yes, I am. I don't know. That happened before we got there. I don't know the answer, sir, and I don't want to guess. Uh, with the other one, again, I, I guess I, I also have come to have some faith in my own ability to look at a man face to face, have him tell me something, have that happen over a period of time, and know whether I can believe him or not. And, and like I told Congressman Schumer, who I wish he were here to hear this, but I, I told him that I had a lot of respect for Jeff Jamar, Bob Ricks, uh, Byron Sage, Clint Van Zandt. Those were the people we dealt with. I thought they shot straight with us. They gave us, they respected the attorney-client privilege. They didn't pump us for information. They, they tried to facilitate this joint goal. They told us they had, we had all the time in the world. I, if, if, if Mr. Schumer is right, if Jamar's going to come in here and change his position and say, I made that decision, and if all I've read is true, is that that decision had already been put into effect before April the 14th when we, he told us we had all the time in the world, because as I understand it, the Attorney General approved it on the 17th, and it had already worked its way up. That meant he would have had to lift Waco if Jamar was involved before the 14th. He just flat lied to us. I refuse to believe that Jeff Jamar just flat lied to us. I may be wrong. Mr. DeGaren? Well, on the two subjects, uh, as far as the negotiator pulling Kavanaugh out, my read on that, no one's told me and no, no one consulted me, but my read on that is because he was ATF and ATF had been so uh, in, emotionally involved in losing agents, um, and rightly so, that his neutrality or his ability to negotiate may have been compromised by that, plus the fact that the FBI moved in and took over. And they should have. The ATF shouldn't have been involved from the from the time of the tragedy uh, until it, everything was secure, uh, they should have been moved out, and rightly so. That's on the negotiator. As far as uh, uh, where the decision was made for the tear gas, or uh, I don't know. We're going to have to break there. Uh, we've got four minutes for a vote. We're going to come back five minutes after the vote. Okay. Committee stands recessed. We'll return for more of Day 5 of the Waco Investigation hearings, but first some programming notes. Wednesday on C-SPAN, South Korean President Kim Young-Sam addresses a joint meeting of Congress. He'll discuss the importance of South Korea's relationship with the United States, the situation on the Korean Peninsula, and his country's evolution into a democracy. See live coverage of his remarks at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday on C-SPAN. Sunday on Book Notes, ABC's John Hockenberry. As a correspondent for NPR, he traveled to the Middle East to cover the Persian Gulf War. In the mid-80s, he volunteered to be the first journalist in space. This weekend, he talks about the challenges he faces 
closer to home. A lot of times in New York, you have to wait for taxis. I mean, in the rain, for instance, you have to wait for five taxis before someone will pick you up if you're in a wheelchair and you're by yourself. If you're in a wheelchair with somebody, they'll stop. If you're in a wheelchair by yourself, you know, you have to kind of take your chances. If it's nice out, you'll do a little better. If it's, there's a 40 mile an hour wind and it's Christmas Eve, believe me, you don't do very well at all. And one cab passed me by, a second cab passed me by, and I remember thinking, oh, come on, Santa, you know, it's time. It's time for a break here. Let's just get me downtown again. I'm freezing. And the third one passed me by. And then somebody comes and sees me, a cabbie comes and sees me, and, and starts to pull over, but then changes lanes. And goes over into the left lane, but he's caught by the light. So he's stuck there in the intersection with his turn signal on, turning left, pretending like he hasn't seen me. Well, I said, well, this is ridiculous. So I roll over, open the door, and say, can you take a fare? He says, yes. I get out, I get in the back seat, I fold up my chair, and I say, please put the chair in the back, in the trunk. And I did. I absolutely said, please, this first time. And uh, he goes, no, it's too cold. Emmy award-winning journalist John Hockenberry and his book, Moving Violations, War Zones, Wheelchairs, and Declarations of Independence, Sunday night on Book Notes at 8 Eastern and Pacific Time. C-SPAN welcomes your comments and thoughts about our programming. If you'd like to call us, the number here in Washington is area code 202-626-7963. It's a voicemail system, so follow the instructions using a touchtone phone. Call the same number if you are interested in videotapes of C-SPAN programming. They are available at a cost of $35 per hour. You can also write us. Send electronic messages on the internet to lowercase viewer at cspan.org. Our fax number is 202-737-3323. And if you'd like to send a card or a letter, our mailing address is 400 North Capitol Street, Northwest, Suite 650, Washington, D.C. The zip code... 2001. We now return to further coverage of today's joint hearing, looking at the 1993 raid on the Branch Davidian compound in Waco, Texas. This is, um, please be seated at the witness table. The Joint Oversight Subcommittee hearings on Waco will now come to order. The chair yields to Mr. Condit in California for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me apologize to you and the witnesses. Once again, um, I have a conflict in schedule, and I have not been here. Um, and uh, I have to leave at this moment to go back to another hearing where we're uh, uh, having a hearing in the Agricultural Committee, which is an extremely important one for, uh, sure. for me and my district. I do want to yield my time to my colleague from Mississippi. In doing that, I want to uh, uh, state that that should not bias me against any of the uh, testimony of the witnesses. I understand they did a good job this morning, but I do want to give him my time, give him the opportunity to ask whatever questions he feels uh, necessary to ask. Right. Would you like me to answer that last one? I didn't, sir. That I thought you asked a good question and we ran out of time. I promised I would get back to you. Should I do it now or do you want me to wait? Let me, let me ask you something else, but, right. but you can talk as long as you want, if you understand. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> so. Mr. Zimmerman, you, uh, interestingly enough, you and your colleague are the first two to say that the deaths of the F AFT agents was justifiable. Now, I'm going to turn the tables on you for a second. I'm going to guess that when you were arguing on behalf of the Davidians that you said, since, since you can't prove that my client individually pulled the trigger in the deaths of those agents, therefore it is not murder. So I'm going to turn the tables on you and ask you to tell me which one was it Conway LeBlue 
Todd McKeehan, Robert Williams, or Stephen Willis that deserve to die that day. I didn't say, at least I don't think I said, that uh, those deaths were justified. Well, what I did was answer, so. no sir, I answered your question. Your question was, have you read or heard or seen anything that would cause you to believe that the murder of those four agents was justified? All I did was answer your question as honestly as I could, and I said, yes sir, I have. One is the jury verdict. They were charged with murder of those four agents. The jury acquitted them of that. That's the answer that I gave you, and I, and I, and I think that's the truthful answer, but sir. But, sir, having turned it around, I'm sure that the defense said that since you cannot prove which one of these Davidians fired, then then no. you can't convict them individually. No, sir, I'm just saying which of these guys deserve to die. You, no. Using that same line of testimony that, that kept the Davidians probably from getting the elected chair. Uh, number one, nobody said that the uh, that murder occurred but you just can't show which of these did it the whole defense well, four dead guys on the ground yeah. mr zimmerman we're talking about the difference between murder though and self-defense uh, congressman taylor and all i'm saying is the defense was that that all of the, any of the davidians that fired were firing in self-defense not just that somebody committed murder but it wasn't these 11. if that had been the defense frankly i think the jury would have would have convicted them all all right but they didn't now uh, weren't some none of those of people deserve to die. Weren't, none of them. Weren't some of the Davidians convicted of manslaughter? Yes, they were. They were. Yes, sir. Okay. Voluntary manslaughter, which is lesser included offense of murder. It takes out the intent, the, the deliberate intent to, to kill, and it's a reaction. I don't want to get into a lengthy thing, okay. but basically if you're provoked and you kill somebody, that's voluntary manslaughter. Also, for a clarification, you were asked by Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer had asked you, if there was reason to take young Miss Jewell away from David Koresh, you said you didn't know of anything. You are an agent of the law. Let me tell you that the Michigan court ruled that there was plenty of reason to keep Miss Jewell away from David Koresh and prohibited her mother from taking her anywhere near David Koresh based on the testimony they received. I'm aware of that. Yes, sir. And now, in fairness, I would like you to, to answer the question that you have requested. Right. You, you had, at one earlier point, you had made a, a statement that or asked a question or pointed out that in answer to another congressman's question, I stated that no administrative or criminal disciplinary action had been taken against anybody and that based on uh, Special Agent Mer uh, uh, Merletti's testimony yesterday that in his report he reported in answer to a question by somebody else that in his opinion that a felony f offense had been committed by the two special agents who had lied to a federal investigator that they had violated federal law and all I said was that that not, that has there's been no administrative action based on that felony nor no criminal proceeding and you said well aren't they assumed innocent okay, and you, I you, think you are I, are you I talking about the two agents you. who failed to get the message from Rodriguez and proceeded with the raid Is that I don't know what Mr. Merletti was talking about I, I precisely but all I was pointing out is that their own investigation indicated a felony offense had been committed. And then you correctly pointed out they have been convicted of nothing. And I wholeheartedly agree with that. They're entitled to the presumption of innocence, to a trial, and so forth. Just like the point I want to make about the way things are supposed to happen in this country is when someone's suspected of a crime, even if it's child abuse, even if it's capital murder, we give them a trial. A jury finds them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt before they go to sentencing. Then a jury or a judge sentences them, and an appeals court makes sure the trial con was conducted with due process. And then and only then do we kill them. We don't kill them first, like happened in Waco it's on April the 19th. And it's a shame the Davidians didn't get that message, sir. I have made a promise to Miss Lee that I would yield her one minute of Mr. Condit's time. I do so now. You're very kind, Mr. Taylor. Thank you very much. Very quickly, let me, as I was uh, finishing my question, Mr. DeGuerin, we're asking uh, what would make individuals uh, follow uh, an individual like uh, Mr. Koresh. Uh, I was saying that to acknowledge uh, that you had the followers and people who deeply believed, and then you had uh, certainly Mr. Koresh. And I know you're a defense attorney. I'm not asking you to uh, negatively assess uh, what would have been your client and may still be his family members. But my question would be, in the time that you had with him, did he tell you how he came to power? I just need a yes or no on the answer. Did he tell you how he came to power? Yes and no. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there's uh, did an he, explanation. Did he explain the 1987 uh, incident? And yes. let me just repeat, and that will be the wind-up of my question, and that is, 
that in 1987, uh, despite the facts that may be in surrounding it, he came on to the compound uh, in camouflage and there was a 45-minute gun battle. And I think that is distinguishable from Seventh-day Adventists, who are in fact pacifists. And so it may have been a spin-off of a denomination, but I think if we separate out Mr. Koresh and those passionate followers, um, his uh, direction uh, led in a more violent turn than one, the Adventist church, and as well possibly the followers who were there with him uh, by way of his entry as the leader into that compound. Uh, to, to respond to that, that was not uh, the way that he came to be the uh, spiritual leader of the Branch Davidians. That was uh, a dispute between David Koresh and his followers and a man named George Roden, who was, uh, well, who's, who's been found by a jury to be criminally insane. I do understand and the facts, but there was a gun battle. Was there, there was not? a gun battle. Okay. Uh, in, and uh, after following that gun battle, David Koresh surrendered to the sheriff of McLennan County and surrendered all their guns. And he was tried on a charge of attempted murder. Uh, all the persons that were tried were found not guilty, except for David Koresh, who was, uh, there was a hung jury, and the, the district attorney then dismissed the case. And, and I understand that. He just engaged in the gun battle, even though Time. the determination was different legally, Time's but there was a gun battle that yeah. David Koresh participated in. Inspired. I thank you, Mr. DeGuerin. Thank you. And now, Chair, now yields to Mr. McCollum of Florida for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, early in this testimony today, one of you, and I believe it was Mr. Zimmerman, indicated you thought that a bureaucrat in Washington was responsible for ending the negotiations, that indeed the, the field officers of the FBI wanted to continue what progress you were making, what you thought was being made. Is, did anyone with the FBI say anything to either of you, and I'll start with you, Mr. Zimmerman, at any time which indicated that there was pressure coming from Washington to go with this CS gas assault as opposed to the negotiations? Sir, my first knowledge of a CS and tank attack uh, occurred at 6 uh, 15 in the morning on April the 19th when my answering service called and said the phone's ringing off the hook with the press and I turned on the television and that's the first notice I had of that attack. They did not tell us in advance of course. But did they give you any indication they were getting pressure not to negotiate? No sir, uh, as a matter of fact, my, I, I have a recollection and I understand now that there's some dispute about it by the FBI but I have a distinct recollection as does Mr. DeGarren, that after we talked, gave them this information about the April 14th letter, that they'd be out within two weeks, well, they said they well, had all the time in the you, world. Why do you have the feeling that a bureaucrat in Washington was pressuring them or making this decision instead of somebody in the field to go with the assault, recommending it back up the other way? Based on, I guess, my earlier answer is that Jeff Jamar, as far as I know, had never been anything but straight with us. Bob Ricks had never been anything but straight with us. Byron say, had been nothing but straight with us. Why, why would they tell us? We have all the time in the world. Same, same question to you, Mr. DeGarren. Let, let me say that I had an early conversation with, with uh, Jeff Jamar in which he mentioned that some people had discussed or said something about uh, dismantling the building and putting tear gas in, but that, that they weren't seriously considering that. And it was an offhand conversation. Uh, it was very early in my relationship with him. I never got the idea that he was under any pressure to do anything. Um, I, I disagree a little bit with Jack on that. I just never got that idea. Well, for what, what it's I, worth, Department, in the Treasury or in the Justice Department report on page 270, it says that Byron Sage and in an ensuing two-hour conversation on April 15th, apparently uh, that he had, I guess, with the Attorney General, said further negotiations with the subject of the compound would be fruitless. Uh, further advised uh, Webb Hubble in this case that Corey had been disingenuous in his discussions with Sage about the seven seals. The FBI had not succeeded in getting anyone released from the compound through negotiation. It was at a total impasse, nothing more he or the negotiators could do to persuade Corey to release anyone else. Uh, would do any good, and law enforcement personnel at Waco were getting tired, uh, and their tempers were fraying, and in, in essence, this is all in support of what appears from this report to have been a decision that Sage, at least, was involved with making as early as the 12th of April. Now, we haven't heard from them yet, but I'm reading from the report. Did you uh, say 12th or 15th? Well, the 15th is when this phone call uh, was discussion was made, but 
The paperwork here through pages that precede it show that the FBI apparently originated this plan and took it up with Potts and Clark, um, or that Potts and Clark took it up, I should say, from the field as early as the 12th with uh, somebody in the Attorney General's office. So it, it, it was around for quite a while, but it was being embraced as early as the 12th, and this phone conversation took place on the 15th. So is any of that surprising to you? Well, it, uh, not. I guess I can't say I'm surprised now because I've read those reports and, and I see that that was going on at the time. What what disturbs me though is that there was not apparently was not any input about this this breakthrough that we had on April the 14th and and advice from and, and the nobody religious. apparently passed that on to the attorney general and it doesn't look like they passed it on to the president either because there's a, a notation we have with us from the FBI files of interviews of, of Bruce Lindsay at the White House. Uh, indicating that a meeting on April 15th took place in which uh, he was briefed and presumably briefed the uh, president on this very same thing, that the negotiations were absolutely an impasse, they weren't going to go anywhere, and uh, it was just over the hill. Now, having said all of that, I want to direct your attention somewhere else. The uh, Treasury Department's been putting out more stuff here in the last hour or two. They say that uh, with regard to this videotape that supposedly is missing in a press release today, uh, that the ATF originally planned to make a videotape of the warrant execution of, from the undercover house. The camera was set up in the window and connected to a VCR recorder. However, in the period before arrival of the cattle trailers, the agents found that whenever they keyed their radio microphone, the tape entered from the VCR. For this reason, or rejected from the VCR, for this reason, the VCR was never turned on. If a videotape operation had been made, it would have confirmed the evidence presented to the trial by the ATF evidence in the media that the Davidians fired first. Now, does that enlighten you in any way about what happened to this tape, or is there another tape we're looking for aside from the one they're referring to? Uh, that doesn't enlighten me, no. Uh, I, I just can't imagine, with the amount of money and preparation and planning that went into this massive raid, that the, the videotape didn't make it. Korish told me that he saw a video camera. Uh, there's a tape that I have here of Korish talking to the negotiators in which he discusses what happened at the front door and how you guys have the tape. I saw the, the camera. He, this, this tape was made on uh, April the 13th. Uh, Jack and I both filed, I think we both filed, motions with the, with the court to preserve this tape. I'd like to have the opportunity to complete my answer and, and, and play the tape, but I don't want to take away from well, the time. I understand, and maybe Mr. the Chairman will give you that. I want to ask you one other question. Uh, you had indicated uh, earlier in testimony that there were several times when Mr. Corey had had promised to go out or had said he was going to come out or whatever and he didn't and Mr. Schumer in asking you questions seemed to imply that he'd got a bunch of data he wanted to have paperwork introduced that would go over those cases uh, on earlier occasions presumably leading one to the conclusion that why should he now uh, on the 14th of April uh, live up to this commitment could you run over Mr. DeGaren for us how you uh, analyze the reasons why Corish did not uh, come out on the earlier occasions and what was different about this one. I had difficulty understanding why he would not walk out with me and surrender to a Texas Ranger uh, and get into the criminal justice system. He saw the logic of that and the advisability of that and so I was having difficulty understanding why it was that he he wouldn't say yes I'll go right now and I tried to understand that by understanding his religious doctrine um, and I asked for advice from Arnold and Tabor and, and, and what I learned was that more important to him, more overriding to him was this religious doctrine and when he could interpret the religious doctrine to say that it was consistent with him coming out and going into the criminal justice system rather than dying on the spot, he would. And so my my talks with him began to to go more to that to understanding that perhaps the doctrine didn't say you're going to die now uh, the apocalypse is coming much later the years or, or or much later than that and and that's why i think there was a breakthrough but why didn't he come out earlier that was the question i'd asked yes first. that's the, that's the answer because of this overriding religious concern. I didn't agree with it. I'm not trying to justify it, and I, I don't think it was justified. I wanted him out. <laughs> I mean, this was, 
I wanted a live client in court. We had a defensible case, and I was trying to get him to come out and trying to make him understand that he needed to, but he wouldn't. He wouldn't, he said, because it wasn't written for him to come out yet. He was waiting to get that word. When he did get the word, that's why I say it was such a great breakthrough on April the 13th and 14th. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, can I ask you unanimous consent that the piece of the paper that has this press release on it about the videotape from the Treasury Department be admitted into the record? Without objection, so ordered. Thank and, you. and in order to complete my answer on that question, may I play that tape? It's a, a, about two minutes, and it's a tape that was made by the FBI. It's in the evidence here, as I understand it. It'll just take about two minutes. May I do that? Yeah, I, I'm reserving the right to object. We've What's had the state a, your objection? Yeah, we've had We've had a rule against these kinds of things. The first little program was admitted, the rest are not. If we want to take change the rules, we can, but we ought to go over. Did you, did, okay. Yes, did and you, you told, you and it was said that that was not going to happen again. You did yours, we did ours, et cetera. How about, would you be willing to submit your tape for evidence? Okay, I would just say that if we do this tape, we have other tapes that we'd like inserted into the record, and as long as it will be allowed to insert, we will be allowed to insert our tapes. I have no problem with Mr. DeGaran's tape. It's not the question of the tape, this tape or not, it's a question of basic fairness. Thank you for your concerns. I think the chair will just say this, if you'll submit the tape for evidence, uh, we will all, those of us that are interested, will listen to the tape. Is that, is that a fair process? I mean, I not here at the hearing, but later. We don't want yes. to get into a battle. Right to object when I ask the question. Uh, I'd just like to know what is that tape really, Mr. DeGarry? It, it's a tape that was made by the FBI during the negotiations on the 13th of April, the day before we got the letter uh, in which he guaranteed that he was coming out, and it discusses what happened on March the 28th at the door and it discusses that he saw a video camera that was filming what happened at the original raid. I and would think that anybody that wants to get at the truth would be interested. Would you like I, to I think we ought to hear the tape. No, I would I said, simply say I will object unless I get the majority's consent. We have a bunch of tapes, both about related to today and later, that are dispositive. And as long as we can do our tapes, I, think it's I have based, no it's objection based, to you doing yours. Mr. Schumer, it will be based on the particular tape at the time. No, then I will Chairman, object because it's Mr. your Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like yes, a, uh, uh, have a parliamentary inquiry. State your uh, inquiry. The, uh, when we had our discussion at the beginning of these proceedings and we decided because of objections by Mr. Schumer's side to proceed under normal, uh, normal order, regular order, uh, there was a discussion that at that point, I think the chairman will recall this, about the rule under which uh, uh, tapes and other documentary evidence uh, should be submitted. And uh, my parliamentary inquiry isn't, uh, isn't it in the normal course of business, regular order, uh, to, uh, to allow that to be submitted or played or presented by a witness. And I'm on wondering on what grounds uh, okay. that would be objectionable. Continuing to Mr. Schumer, would you like right to object? My, the the parliamentary inquiry is to the chairman. Okay. Uh, as far as I, uh, the way I see it, that we should s submit the evidence and allow it to be played, and as, as long as it's pertinent to what the discussion is at the time. I think at the same time, if Mr. Schumer has a tape at, at a later on, in another panel, and, and, and a witness is presenting a piece of evidence, and it's pertinent, then we ought to take Continuing each. my reservation, and that seems fair to me, and I'll be willing to do that, it seems, but I just want the, uh, the audience and everybody else, everyone on the majority and minority, today, certain members of the FBI wanted to bring tapes to the later, to the second, uh, second or third panel, I'm not sure which. We had discussions with the majority staff, and we were told that all tapes would be off limits, and hence they didn't bring them. Now, there are plenty, there are lots of other tapes, believe me, we, uh, that we would like to play, and I just want to make sure before... No, no the chair is a rude, the chair, the chair, I'm trying to get this fair. I'm trying to get this done fairly. We're, we're, we're gonna, my we're reservation. Not, uh, continuing my reservation, please. We sir. heard your reservation. Well, I'd like to just and we, continue. And the chair is prepared to, to Mr. Roll. Chairman. Okay, please. Mr. And what, what, yes, Mr. Just, Chairman, I'd like to, to respond to Mr. Schumer's uh, uh, reservation. Brief please me, please proceed. Well, then wait. Then if uh, just if the gentleman would forbear, I was right. cut off by the gentleman from Georgia because he wanted a ruling. Okay. He's not cutting you off. He's cutting me off. Let me just finish my I, point. I thought the chair had ruled. No, the chair is not ruled. The chair was about to finish the ruling, but... Okay, let me that? just finish my point. 
and that is this that the majority staff had said no tapes and therefore those tapes none henceforth and we went along with that the rules keep changing I don't let mind me, but me, we need me, notice and fairness my understanding of what happened is yesterday I believe it was yesterday you wanted to introduce a tape my side didn't want to do it we had introduced the CNN tape in the beginning I said it's only fair to allow yours now we have the third tape I do not want to get into a tape war or a video war or any of the other kinds so I think at this point the chair will rule that the, the tape can be submitted for evidence those of us that want to listen to it will listen to it uh, if, if that's a fair rule. Okay, then we will do the same. Without, without objection, Just, so ordered. We will well, do the same. Mr. Uh, Chairman, so yes. is the ruling of the chair that the, the playing of the tape is out of order? Is that the chair's ruling? The playing of the tape is out of order. We will accept it as evidence. To the ruling of the chair. Okay, well, it requires I unanimous I mean, consent to, to play it. As, as to what the, what the problem is with, with playing the tape. Mr. Chairman. Okay, it requires... It requires unanimous consent to play the tape, and objection has been heard. From who? I, th I thought Mr. 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 Schumer, Schumer objected. I thought, I thought, I thought, and, and again, I, I'm not trying to butt in, but uh, but I thought that Mr. Schumer said as long as well, he, if they yeah, to but he qualified by yeah, saying yeah. that he can also introduce, and I got a feeling just knowing on past actions around here, not not pointing any fingers, that we're going to have reams and reams of tapes, and we're going to have video parades and everything else. We're going to be here long, long hours tonight, well after midnight, the rate we're going, and this is just another charade to slow things down. I just think at this point it just makes good common sense to just accept it as evidence and move on. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, yes, I, I know I'm, I'm going to feel your wrath for doing this, but I'll be very... Not you, Mr. Coburn. I'll be very brief about this. I, I would be uneasy about uh, admitting this tape with an agreement that we would open the floodgates for everybody and his brother who had a tape from here on in. I, I do think, however, the chair might want to consider hearing this tape and then s subsequent tapes that may surface consider each tape on its own bottom rather than having a blanket endorsement that everybody who has a tape will come forward. Well, we, we appreciate your comments, the chair's rule. Okay. Um, on your time has expired. Under, uh, I would just like to um, ask a couple questions that, uh, <coughs> on, on accountability. Mr. Zimmerman, you talked about the Marine Corps. I have a son that's in the Marine Corps, and I can understand what you're talking about. I've also been in small business and large corporate entities, and, uh, you know, accountability is, is the name of the game. Somewhere along the line, somebody's got to be responsible. Who do you think is responsible for this tragedy that happened on April 19th? On April the 19th? The general is responsible for everything that happens in his or her command. The general is responsible. Right. Anybody above the general? In my view, the general is about as high as you go. I would. I was talking in the military you, context. You're referring, okay, that's in the military. Yes. Who is the general then in, at Waco? whoever made that decision, the final decision to go in on April 19th with that military attack. Who do you think did that? I really don't know, sir. I mean, there's been... Mr. DeGaron, who do you... There has been... If I may... I yeah. Go ahead. We can't... We someone, up time. someone jumped up and said, I'm responsible, the buck stops here, and uh, gained a lot of uh, public admiration for that stance, but has never been held accountable. Never been held accountable. Okay. And, and Mr. Uh, Altman's letter to Mr. Benson dated April 15th saying something tragic is going to occur on the 19th and it just kind of got discarded. Does that cause you a problem where we have people in government that, you know, they find out about these things and, and do nothing about them? That bothers me that something didn't get transmitted across, but it does not affect my earlier opinion that it was not the Secretary of the Treasury that was responsible. It was the Attorney General of the United States that was responsible. On April 14th, did Jeff Jamar tell you that you have all the time necessary to end this peacefully? Yes, sir. And what happened? What happened to that? I mean, is, is, did something just get jank, yanked out of his hands? The truthful answer to that is I don't know what happened. My, my assumption was is that that decision was overridden at higher headquarters. 
And, and if I could answer that, someone said something earlier about Byron Sage uh, making a recommendation at an earlier point in time. Byron Sage was an assistant special agent in charge in Austin. He was junior to both Jeff Jamar, who was a special agent in charge out of San Antonio, and special agent in charge Bob Ricks out of the Oklahoma City office. Both of them were senior to Byron Sage. I find it incredible that, that a junior uh, special agent like Sage would be able to make a decision uh, of, of that significance. Mr. DeGeron. I, I've thought a lot about that because uh, Byron Sage, excuse me, uh, Jeff Jamar said to me when I was frustrated a little bit and, and told him that uh, I wish I could say he's coming out today, but it's going to be a while until these seals get written. Uh, he said, don't worry, we've got all the time it takes. You, and then the FBI would have allowed uh, for us to surrender to, to anybody other than the FBI? Well, was that discussed, the Texas Rangers? It was discussed. Um, it was never rejected. Uh, I thought it would be a good idea, and I wanted to see it happen, but uh, it, I don't think that that's what caused there not to be a surrender. Describe your feelings after you heard that the raid had moved forward. The gas was putting in. And both of you, just describe how you felt. And were you helpless? Was there anything you could do? I was, what, I was just shocked. describe your emotions. I was shocked. I was in uh, North Texas getting ready to start a trial. I was certain that we had some time. And when I got the phone call to look at the screen and see what's going on, I immediately called the FBI. I wasn't able to reach Jamar. The only message that I got, uh, and I can't remember the name of the agent I talked to, was, we don't need you. I said I'd come back down. I'll go back in. Just hold off. Let me see if I can tell them that you're out of patience. And I rushed from there to Waco. By the time I drove from Denton to Waco, everyone was dead. The fire was over. How did you feel about that? Does, I mean, did you just pull over the side of the road, or what, what, what went through your... Mr. Zeloff, I met most of the people in there. I met the children. I wanted to be part of helping to save their lives. And I've... Um, it had to I've, be rough. I feel that if I had been a little bit more persuasive, I could have gotten David Korsh out of there quicker. And so I feel that I failed. But I also feel like it was a great mistake to start the tanks and tear gas. Whether you accept that David Korsh started the fire and committed suicide with all of those people, or whether it was accidental or not, there's one thing certain. Those people would be alive today if those tanks and tear gas hadn't started rolling on April the 19th. Mr. Zimmerman, same question. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I was in Houston, Texas at the time that the operation began. I waited for the, I, I, I called, reached Henry Garcia from the negotiation team who had been sort of friendly with us when we were there. He answered the phone. I said, what's going on? He said, uh, have you seen the television? I said, yes. Uh, are we still going to be part of the, of the surrender plan? Because I thought at that time, uh, like everybody else did, that people might come out after that. He said, I can, I'm not at, at liberty to discuss the tactical plan, but go ahead and come on up. So I reached Dick, and he started down from Denton, and I started up from the other direction, both three-hour drives. And uh, the fire broke out when I was still about two hours from Waco. Well, how did you feel? And, 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 and maybe each of you then also tell me, how, how did you feel the FBI must have felt? Well, but how did you feel? How did I? I felt betrayed. I, I, I had, was hopeful. Uh, I was clearing my schedule. I thought they'd be out within another 10 days. And I could not believe uh, that the FBI or the Justice Department or whoever it was would undertake such a dangerous operation, knowing that there were old men and pregnant women and children in there. I just couldn't believe that they would do that. And then there was a KTRH radio, a, a talk show, had a live report from it. And uh, so I was on the road actually driving while that building was burning. And, and I, I have to tell you, uh, you won't hear this very often from defense lawyers, but I, I echo Mr. Daguerre, and I, I had a sense of failure. Uh, 
unlike any I'd ever had before. Uh, not that I've never failed before, but not where people who had put their lives in my hands died. The question was asked before the red light. How do you think the FBI felt? My view was that, you know, I've had cynical remarks made to me after speeches because Bob Ricks was up in, and, and it seemed to be uh, almost with tears in his eyes and people were saying, you know, all he was worried about is losing his job and his career. I don't believe that. I think he really did feel bad. I think he's a good, what I call a good cop. Good cops don't really care too much about what happens to bad people or guilty people, but they sure do care about things like children and innocent people, and they don't like something like this to happen. My view was that was a genuine remorse being displayed by Mr. Ricks. I think Jeff Jamar had genuine remorse. After all, he was in charge. This was his operation. He was the scene commander. His career was over, and 80 people were dead because of something that was technically under his control because he was the on-scene commander. I think the FBI felt terrible. I hope that when they come here, they don't tell you that they didn't feel terrible. My, my response, Mr. Zeliff, um, I saw Bob Ricks at the press conference that followed the fire, and he did have a, a break in his voice, a frog in his throat, if you will. I think it was sincere, and I called him after that. We had, we had had a good relationship. I said, uh, Mr. Ricks, uh, I think I called him Bob, uh, my heart goes out to you. I know that you didn't intend for it to end this way. I'm going to be critical of you. I'm going to be critical of the decision, but it's not personal, and I'm, I'm sorry that it ended this way. It may not have been his decision. This uh, concludes this panel. We thank you both very, very much. Uh, we will resume uh, at five minutes after the next vote. And uh, again, I think we're going to go a ways, but uh, we will uh, adjourn for until uh, five minutes after the next vote. We'll return for more of day five of the Waco investigation hearings, but first some programming notes. C-SPAN's Washington bill. Journal. Every morning right, we take a look ahead at what's developing in our nation's capital and review uh, the day's headlines. Issues. At the